listening to episode 137 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I'm interviewing Adam Bergstrom once again. Adam is a return guest, a renaissance man, a legend. I really respect that he's getting up there in chronological age, but he's kept his mind very malleable and open to change and accepting new ideas. And that is very rare, if not nearly impossible to find. Most of the elderly people that I meet, I like to have conversations with them here in Idaho. And I'll open up a philosophical dialogue or a dialogue about health. And you can tell in the way that someone speaks how their mind operates and it's really sad to me that the older someone gets chronologically which is different from your biological age the more rigid and solid they become in what they know and i believe health is largely about adapting adapting to new information which i did i walked away from a million dollar omega-3 dha business a few years back, and now I dedicated my life to sharing the fact that these fats are not only not essential for health, but they are harmful to your health and will cause all sorts of disease, especially neurodegeneration and diabetes. And the man that I'm interviewing today, Adam Bergstrom, was the one that introduced me, that planted the seed that omega-3s are toxic. And it took several years for that seed to sprout. But let me tell you, when it did, it busted through the concrete and absolutely changed my life and helped me connect many dots, even in my personal life, looking back at how I was raised and the health conditions that I dealt with and how it was connected to omega-3 DHA poisoning. So in this interview, we talk about the difference between omega-3s and omega-6s, alpha-linolenic acid and alpha-linoleic acid, and the nuance in the different wording there. We talk about movies, oranges, sugar, glyphosate, blue blocking, melatonin, vitamin D, oats, ear candling, vegetables as a source of retinol, castor oil, and I ask him a few questions from the audience. It's always fun. He is such a wealth of information. Here he is, Adam Bergstrom. All right, we are back with the legend, Adam Bergstrom. Welcome back. <laughs> Glad to be here, Matt. Yeah, it's always really fun uh, talking with you. And every time I ask my listeners to send in questions, um, they just go crazy asking uh, every type of question. And I think it's awesome um, that you're just, uh, you dabble in kind of a little bit of everything. (laughs) And he mounted his horse and rode off in all directions with my astrology. (laughs) I think it's true. Yeah, some people I think get, get annoyed by that. And they kind of look at it as like ADD or something, but there's a lot of dots to connect, I find. And some of them are across uh, distances that you wouldn't imagine, right? Like two things that shouldn't be connected actually are. Yeah. I've always liked questions. In fact, when I was on the lecture circuit, I would get up in front of the uh, the crowd and say, any questions? And say, well, what do you mean any questions? What's the lecture about? Whatever you want it to be about. What do you <laughs> ask me? <laughs> and a lot of people loved it. And I used to go to lectures and couldn't wait for my question to come up an hour. When is he going to stop talking so I can ask it? So a lot of people liked that approach. Some people were really annoyed by it. <laughs> Can't please everybody, but those are pretty good odds, I guess. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's more of like an interactive uh, style that's what I couldn't stand about college. Um, when I went to college for like six years, was just you're listening to someone just rant like on a stage, and there's no back and forth. Right? I feel like that would be more productive. I think so. Yeah, definitely. It, it's interactive, and and people like mm-hmm. to get their two cents and find out 
what's going on, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so I was peeking at your site. It looks like you're still uh, pumping out eBooks, huh? You got a new yellow fat disease one coming. I, I really didn't want to do it, but there's been such developments in yellow fat. Uh, in fact, uh, pretty soon, uh, there's going to be some major changes in that uh, because the companies now for biodiesel use soy oil without the omega-3 fatty acids because it gums up the works. And they're now saying uh, you want the high oleic oil and and get rid of the linolenic acid because it's not heart healthy. It's heart healthy to get rid of the linolenic acid. Now, that's omega-3 fatty acids, but no one seems to have noticed. Now, they're very cautious about that. They put their ads. There's a new company with an ultra-low linolenic acid for heart healthiness and biodiesel, Calix. The first company that tried the ultra-low to get rid of uh, omega-3s completely, they went bankrupt. And then Monsanto took over in the low, but not ultra low business. And DuPont took over after that, the Pioneer Seed Company. And uh, now this new company, Calx, actually it's been around a while, is subtly introducing it. Because we're talking now a trillion dollar business in ultra low linoleic acid compared to billions of dollars in the fish oil. So they're going to conflict eventually. And every time you see high oleic oil, they don't tell you how they got that. It's taking out the linolenic acid because the fish oil, flax oil, whatever, gums up the works, including atherosclerosis and all of those kind of things. Interesting. Yeah, someone sent me a photo of some chips. And I guess in a lot of chip products, like healthy chips, they're putting high oleic know sunflower oil in it so what you're saying is that means they took out the they took out the uh, omega-6s is that right or the omega-3s the for omega-3s sure, oh. yeah for sure in the high oleic soybean industry which makes me now suspicious of the high oleic sunflower to, to do that it's gmo by the way they have to use chris they couldn't do it Back in the day with normal GMOs, the company that went bankrupt tried it. But now with CRISPR, they can do it. The company claims it's natural, non-GMO, because they took genes that were in existence already and melded them together. But they're being criticized by the organic people. But the organic people are very careful to not explain what they're doing, I noticed. So there are a lot of people who know the truth about this, including many people on supposedly our side, the organic side of the picture, that know, because otherwise they would reveal the truth of what they're actually doing. So it's really interesting. Many more people are in the know about this than I first. Uh, I understood it was just ignorance, but there's actually a significant number of the, the, uh, the population that knows the truth about this. It's just that you can't find it on the internet unless you know how to look. <laughs> do you swear words and uh, quotations, right? <laughs> I used to do that. Now, basically, yellow fat disease and all its ramification, wooden breast disease, put those in, come in the back door. They expect you to come in the front door, so they're all ready for you. They have ways of you, diverting you to where exactly where they want and the studies they want. So you'll find, what, 40, 400,000 studies <laughs> that you know, about the glories of omega-3s. And then you miss the equal amount under yellow fat disease about how it's aging. Basically, it's an analog for aging in the mitochondria and in the uh, extracellular tissue, too. So. Yeah, and, and, and back it up, I think... Um... Uh, people get confused about linoleic and linolenic and linolenic, alpha linolenic acid is the omega-3 one and alpha linoleic is the omega-6, right? And they're using these words to kind of confuse us a little. (laughs) Yep. In fact, one of the studies I saw said, you, our product is high in omega-3s, but low in alpha linolenic and gamma linolenic acid. 
Well, that's the same thing, actually, <laughs> in this study. Now, that really blew my mind that they can get away with it. And, and even I have read professional journals, biotech journals. They just assume that Monsanto had taken out the linoleic acid. I mean, the omega-6s. But they put, they're very clear linoleic, but even these peer-reviewed journals mistake it. They don't know the difference. And that's how they play on the end. The first time you interviewed me, I got confused about it even. And after that, I thought, you know, I gotta, I'm being tricked just as much as these other people. I better learn the difference between the end, which now to me stands for no. <laughs> N-O. <laughs> if you see the end, then that's omega-3. If you don't see the end, it's omega-6. That's the way it works. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one of the myths is that omega-3s are less in, are, are actually anti-inflammatory and they say omega-6s are inflammatory but the what fact that you share is that omega-6s are safer right than omega-3s they are actually safer now here's the funny thing they are they are anti-inflammatory but how do they work they don't build your immune system they cut it down now is that practical that means if you take them you're subject to everything that comes with your way because it has hijacked your immune system Transplant doctors recommend omega-3s so that your organ doesn't get rejected by the body and it's a normal process that you and I, non-transplant people, uh, have, don't have to worry about. So they used to use x-rays. You went to the doctor, you had inflammation, they zapped you with x-rays and it took care of the inflammation. But think of the side effects and the same thing to a lesser degree uh, with omega-3 fatty acids. It's like getting x-rays. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Um, I've been talking with a friend about uh, peptide therapy, like uh, amino, it's like amino acid chains, like up to 50 long. And people are using them for different retinal diseases. And my friend Victor was just recently telling me, because um, he's working on healing his eyes, he has like partial blindness. And he's telling me these some of these peptide injections are beneficial for Stargardt's disease. And that got my brain going because that's like a lipofuscin, you know, eye disease. Um, and so I, I mean, I, I guess this PUFA problem in lipofuscin kind of breaks down our proteins, right? I wonder if that's how, how these peptides are healing the eyes, just provide, it's, it's rebuilding like the foundation or something that got broken down by lipofuscin. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Even cataracts can be eaten away. Uh, Ray P hmm. has gone into this, and it really surprised me. He said, people think that the lens is something solid it, that doesn't have any life, like a fingernail, supposedly, and it's you can't regain it. But he said that's not true, and he's had experience in actually people getting rid of their cataracts through diet alone, usually with progesterone, I, I believe, and uh, and even oranges can help. I don't know if that can get rid of a cataract. I myself, before I met Ray Pete, I went for 23 three years wearing glasses. And now one day it just stopped. I, I looked at the paper, realized as I was reading it, and before I needed glasses to read the, uh, the sub headline on the darn thing. So 23 years, in the 80s, I started wearing glasses, and then uh, I pretty much gave them up. I still, if I read a paperback, it's easier on my eyes. But before, if I went to a bookstore and I've forgotten my glasses, which I wore around my neck, that's it. I can't read anything but the titles. I couldn't read a newspaper or anything. And now, it doesn't matter if I forget my glasses. I read it anyway. It's just a little more difficult for me than if it's really small print and in a darkened room. Do you think there's a connection with... Um... Like, like there's this book called The Illuminous Life that I read um, by a really interesting author that's done a lot on, on light, Jacob Lieberman. And he was basically making the connection between like our outlook on life and our eye health. Like, do you think just thinking more about the future or something or like having a more open perspective can alone help your, increase your vision? Very uh, likely. In fact, uh, somebody I know, I've, I've got to figure out how to disguise him. He, he was telling me that he was having trouble with his uh, right eye because, uh, and he said it was because of the computer. And I said, it's a female trauma. 
you know my deal about left and right. So uh, he, I said, for instance, I'm on the internet more than you are, and I don't have any eye problems. So then it turned out that he had seen his wife having sex with another man and didn't tell. Of course, it led to a divorce, but that never came up. And when you don't face those issues or do something about it, I'm not saying he had to go shoot the guy who was with his wife, but he just closed the door and went back to sleep when he was what he saw. And that's the kind of thing that leads to traumas where that gets hung up in the neurology. You know, I still remember getting beat up by a gang when I got out of high school. And, you know, I had a footprint of the cat, the cat paws in the bottom of those shoes on my back. And my friend was knocked out and they kicked him in the head. And uh, to every once in a while, maybe once a year, I relive it where we beat the heck out of those guys, you know. So it's in your nervous system. You don't get it out by brain tapping and all these tricks. You have to do something, either find something greater or relive it and do something directly about it if the person's alive or you confront it or you're in a cycle. Many people, uh, okay, here's a woman. Can you explain this to me? I get divorced. I meet a man in my dancing class. One month later, he leaves me for his ex-wife. Then I meet another man. We have a relationship for a month. He leaves me for his ex-wife. I meet another man. It happens a third time after a month. What's going on here? And I said, did you have a father that traveled a lot when you were a child? Yeah, I did. He was in the oil business. So I bet really saw him. See, that's worse of a trauma. If the person uh, abandoned you and said, I'm not, I don't want to see you anymore, you can get it out. But the mother probably said something like, oh, that's how we put beans on the table. You'll have to learn to do and be, be an adult before your time, in other words, when you needed that father's love. And there it was. After that, she had other problems, but that problem was solved. She got in the relationship and everything worked out because she realized how she had been tricked by her own mind, recycling something that she had not faced in the past. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, you got me back on movies. Uh, one of my first jobs was Blockbuster Video. And I used to watch <laughs> wow. a lot of movies. <laughs> and, and then I, I, when I got into health, I thought they were a waste of time. Like I would rather just listen to a lecture or a podcast rather than watch a movie. But you kind of got me back on movies, not every night, but here and there because of that reliving thing, even like a slasher film or a horror film, you know, people in the health community would say, why are you putting that in your head? But I mean, that could be like a, like getting revenge or something. It's a safe way to do it. Right? <laughs> That's what I find. Basically, I like revenge movies because I get the stuff out of me. And I have probably seen every revenge movie that's come down the pipe. My favorite lightweight revenge movie is, uh, what was the name of it? It was about a watermelon farmer where Charles Bronson is a watermelon. Mr. Majestic. I recommend that as a feel good revenge movie. It's an excellent movie. Nice. Uh, I'll check that out. Yeah. I, the one that comes to mind is uh, Taken. That was pretty good. Like this guy's daughter gets kidnapped and then he goes and just wipes out. All of them. <laughs> the, the first one was great. I think after yeah. that, they overdid yeah. it. But the first movie I thought was one of my favorites, too. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Another yeah. one uh, where uh, Sylvester Stallone is in Seattle. And he avenges the death of his brother and finds out where the lies were. I don't remember the name of that. But, but there's there's some really good revenge movies out there. <laughs> <laughs> it kept For me sure. out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, you had me uh, interested in oranges again. I've been seeing your posts on them and that you're eating quite a few. Uh, I'm getting delivered like a 33-foot geodesic dome up here in Idaho. And wow. I'll, I'm going to work on growing fruit where there's snow on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you know, the, some guy's growing oranges in Kansas without a greenhouse. He's figured out how to uh, huh. do that. I, I'm not sure of his technique, but I remember... Uh, he was making quite the internet rounds back about three, four, or five years ago. Yeah, so it can be done and getting it shipped in. I, we just had three apiece, uh, which we do. Mm. We have one of those glass juicers, and uh, it's easy. And I regard it as uh, it, it's helped me a lot. 
I think I was having some problems, including edema and things that went away. How much was because I minimized my omega-3s and how much was the oranges? I really think the oranges played a significant part. And did you just eat them whole? Like I, when I, and back in my fruitarian days, I would just peel like 10, 12 at a time and just eat them. But it did feel like it was pretty harsh on my teeth. Like I always tried to swish with water afterwards. It can. I, ironically, lemons are something with high acidity uh, to start with. Of course, it turns to an alkaline acid in your body. But it actually can retard uh, uh, tooth de decay because the acid is so strong, it kills the acid-causing bacteria that cause the problem. But oranges are kind of in between. I don't think they have enough acid to do that. And you have to be careful to get get a lemon in your mouth and then wash your mouth after the uh, the damage after the bacteria are killed. Even E. coli is in the mouth. The the problem doesn't come from sugar. You can store your store your teeth if you can take a tooth out. It's not going to decompose until the liquid comes into the sugar, and then what happens? The bacteria show up, and they eat through your enamel. Mm. Yeah, I love your perspective on dental health. Uh, I'm trying to find a an awake dentist out there that's not anti-sugar that kind of gets because every I, I would imagine 99 percent of the holistic dentists are going to say that sugar harms your most of them. I knew a few who uh, who know the truth about that, and uh, Dr. Phillips did uh, at one time. Of course, he didn't like sugar anyway. He said it had adverse effects on the rest of your uh, body. But fructose, particularly, is the is a diabetic sugar. We used to, uh, when I was in the health food business, we'd sell tupelo honey because it was very high in fructose, so much it won't crystallize that di it was safe for diabetics. And now, of course, they make fructose out as the enemy of mankind. It's worse than, worse than glyphosate, worse than the atomic bomb, you know. You know how they can uh, do that. Well, speaking of glyphosate, uh, I, you know, I post a lot about white CNH sugar over the last year or so, since I think you helped me get on that. And um, someone was like, don't you worry about the glyphosate? And I did find a study. I should send it to you if, if you haven't seen it, but it goes through like the glyphosate in different sugars. And it was interesting because uh, cane sugar, refined cane sugar was like, I don't know, 0.24% uh, glyphosate or something like that. And then beet sugar, refined beet sugar was like, like zero, like 0.01%. It was like a huge amount less. Um, so I've been experimenting with beet sugar, but then they say beets are GMO. So I don't know if it's if it matters that much. I mean, do you think glyphosate's kind of overblown, um, especially a small amount in, in you know, like white sugar? <laughs> white cane uh, sugar? Ray Pete thinks it is overblown because it's water soggy. But here's the mm -hmm. problem. If you check what the farmers are doing, they always combine, almost 99% of the time, combine it with an oil-soluble chemical. And those don't even get fresh. They want to use glyphosate to get at Monsanto, and Monsanto lost all three patents on, on glyphosate a long time ago. 60% of glyphosate comes from China now. They don't care about the patent or anything, uh, but glyphosate lost its last patent about five years ago, and uh, its first one uh, was about, uh, I think, the 1970s. You know, it's still used by plumbers and boilermakers because that was its original use in the 1960s. So it's coming in the environment through the water supply. They use it for your water heater, things like that. It keeps the minerals from precipitating, the same thing it does in the human body. Anyway, when you refine the sugar down to white sugar, it gets rid of most of the glyphosate because they don't use the combination of chemicals. They basically use it instead of burning the cane fields. They, uh, they basically uh, chemicalize kill it. It's like it's easier to weed uh, your weeds when they're dead than it is when they're thriving and alive, obviously. That's what they do. Instead of burning it now, they just simply put glyphosate on it. And uh, so I think it's a minor threat, and that's why I prefer uh, white sugar over the brown sugars and the uh, blonde sugars, all these other types of sugars, because they're tampered with. Usually they even spray paint a lot of them with burn sugar or caramel. They put it in like a big car wash and just spray it down. In fact, 
Mm -hmm. Brown sugar is pretty much illegal or raw sugar in this country. Uh, Donald Lay used to get it by going to Sugarland, Texas, and saying he owned cows and he would like some for the cow because it was illegal to have that type of sugar. If you have real ground up raw sugar, you'll see it's quite a bit different than the things you buy in packages at the store. And I've eaten enough of it because they used to have big 25 pound bags of it that would use for our beverages at the Texas Institute of Reflex Science. That's incredible. Yeah, because a lot of people will say, say white sugar is like bleached, right? Is that true? <laughs> well, the bleach pretty much goes off. And I think they have hmm. ways of using less the bleach and more bleach. I take a, hmm. uh, I'm taking a chance on CNH sugar. And so far, uh, I don't eat like, uh, what was the guy, Uncle Dickie? He ate five pounds of sugar a day. He lived 105 or 106 years old, I believe. Uh, but I probably, I'm not sure. I'd probably eat uh, half a cup of sugar a day, something like that. I sweeten things. I sweeten my beans. I sweeten this and that, different things. I even sweeten my, uh, I make a, a pickled onion out of uh, mustard and a little apple cider vinegar. I put sugar in it. And it makes like a young sauce. So, uh, so I don't really, uh, I only use tablespoons of sugar if I have a stress, like if I had an abscess or an infection or even a cold, then I just load up on the sugar at that point. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think people are freaking out about the little things and they don't realize that the liver uses sugar, right, for glycogen and our, the liver is like our master detox organ. And so worrying about glyphosate at the expense of getting sugar, it doesn't really make sense, right? <laughs> right. If you give the liver fructose, and of course, sucrose is about half and half. Uh, when you eat a complex chart, there's no fructose in it. By definition, it's two types of glucose. Uh, you have a uh, Basically, no fructose in any complex chart. It won't build up. So if you have a simple sugar, then it, it can't, it doesn't have to, but it usually has fructose in. All honey, most honeys have sucrose. And again, tupelo is the best of all because it has a lots of fructose. High fructose corn syrup, though, uh, Ray Pete has said there's as much as 37% complex carbohydrates. Because in the process of making it from corn and various other things, even birch trees and things like that, uh, they uh, they uh, add complex carbohydrates that are too expensive to take out. So people are being scammed on uh, high fructose corn syrup. Wow. And complex carbohydrates, that's like what's found in pasta, right? Pasta. And of course, Ray Pete is really against that. I'm mildly against it. I, uh, I don't eat much of it, but I think there's a place for it if it's well cooked. When you have it al dente, it, where it's, uh, undercooked, you can get in problems. He probably, you may have heard one of his interviews where he said his professor saw it could actually block capillaries and showed a microscopic proof of it. So uh, since then, I'm, I make sure that when I do make pasta, and I found one without iron or any any kind of ingredients, once in a while, if I cook something up, I put uh, 10 or 20 uh, little macaronis in there just to give it a, a, a better look, you know. But I really don't eat much carbohydrates except the potato. I'm big on potatoes. Every yeah. night, actually, pretty much. Do you dextrinize them every time? Every time. Yeah, we eat... Uh, yeah. I eat about uh, two a night. The vibrant gal eats about two a night, too. Sometimes they have three. We eat the smaller uh, type of potatoes and usually two eggs each night. Actually, we get we get 24 dozen. So at the, on Thursday and Friday, before we go to farmer's market, we get one egg. But the rest of the week, it's two eggs. And I mix that with uh, raw onion and a little mustard to make a, make a deviled egg kind of thing out of it. And it's really good. And of course, I eat them on time. We eat our potatoes and eggs in the evening when there's a meridian in the acupuncture called uh, circulation and sex meridian. So it helps activate that and keep your hormones flowing. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, most people eat eggs in the morning, right? And so um, you're saying according to timing, you want to do that at night. 
because a, a lot of people seem to be confused about what to eat for breakfast. That was actually one of the questions that someone sent in. They're like, what does Adam eat every day? Um, and I think I've seen some of your posts. It's a handful of nuts and seeds first thing in the morning, right? Usually, like, uh, let's see, uh, for instance, in an average morning, we'll have, uh, I'll have almonds, and almonds have almost no, some authorities claim no omega-3s in it, which even surprised me, uh, but they have some omega-6s, and they mostly have monosaturated oils, and they are really high in vitamin E. That's the reason we eat soaked almonds. There's a lot of reasons for soaking them, too. Uh, then we have some pistachios, maybe two or three. They're high in vitamin E, and because the uh, the walnut has a certain amount of omega threes, but it is good for the brain for manganese and other things, we have about one of those per morning only. Uh, that's our major uh, pupa consideration there. So that's the nuts. Then we have the fruits. Like uh, I'm big on avocado. It's really rich in monounsaturated uh, acids and has uh, lots of protein, lots of minerals, vitamin E, vitamin K, a lot of things like that are in it. And then, uh, so that, that gives you the fat in it. And then we have like a pizzas or pears or apples or whatever else is going to be in season. A lot of times we have, uh, uh, well, there's a bunch of exotic fruits here too, even papaya and things of that nature. What's the name of the fruit I'm forgetting? Begins with a C. Cherimoya. Oh, oh. boy. Cherimoyas are delicious. <laughs> I want to grow that up here. Mark Twain's uh, favorite fruit, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about avocado oil? Because people seem really confused about what oils to cook in. And I tend to just tell them ghee and coconut oil. And, you know, you can use tallow and different things. Um, but, yeah. That, that's the best. I, I would agree with you definitely there because the, uh, the, the coconut oil can be out of time even at night. But if I was going to fry eggs, I'd use either, either ghee or just plain butter. Uh, ghee has the highest smoke point. God, it's close to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. And then butter is behind it. And then, uh, and then you get the coconut oil too. Nobody would cook their eggs in fish oil. So people should ask, why won't they do that? There's actually a reason, and that's another reason they use trans fats oil and why they want the low linoleic acid. It uh, it is not good for you in the first place, and it won't fry. So they're going to substitute. All of the fast food restaurants in America are going to be using low and ultra low linoleic fatty acids, and all of the fish farms to keep the salmon from getting yellow fat disease. When salmon's are in the cold and uh, breed. You just come up river in cold streams uh, versus being in a fish farm all the time. They can handle their omega-3s, but in the fish farm, they can't, and they get yellow fat disease before they even take them out to sell. The, the food would be so bad tasting that they have to use uh, different types of fish food and also ethoxyquin, a Monsanto chemical. So Monsanto has known about yellow fat disease since the 60s. <laughs> and it's it's to prevent the, the uh, is it the boats from exploding? You've written about that. <laughs> it does that too. It, it's amazing. That's really hard to find on the internet, but you'll find it. Coast Guard regulation. You cannot ship fish oil or fish meal or fish products across the ocean without ethoxyquin or one of the other, there's three other chemicals that they use. Ironically, those other chemicals they use used to be recommended by Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw for, uh, because they were an antioxidant. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. they have a lot of side effects. That's why ethoxyquin right. is being t removed from pet food now. Before they could get away with it in pet food, but now it's affecting, you know how dogs are getting those tumors on their body? A lot of your listeners may have had that experience. There's, that's yellow fat disease. It's a major symptom. You can get them other ways, but it's really hard to get them other ways and have omega-3s involved in that tumorization process. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I'm friends with people that, um, you know, like Morley that like cod liver oil and then um, friends with Ben Greenfield that likes fish oil. And I have discussions with uh, these people that are pro-PUFA and 
I think the the belief system is that uh, polyunsaturated fats like omega threes are critical for the mitochondrial membrane, which we don't even know if that exists, right? <laughs> for the cardiolipin, and um, they say that the body has antioxidant systems built in to prevent those from oxidizing. But that's just a story, right? That we've been told. <laughs> According to Ray Peyton, there is no uh, mitochondrial membrane. And there's not even a brain blood barrier. <laughs> he said, this is all medical mythology. And in fact, uh, I had discovered a lot of medical mythology, obviously, back when I was in the health food business in the 70s and 80s and 90s. But since Ray Pete, I've really took a much closer look on a lot of things that I believed at one point. Nitric oxide, serot serotonin. I always knew serotonin. There was something wrong with that. And now it's even worse than I thought. You know, if you have stinging nettles, what do you think that is that stings you? It's the serotonin. And what was the name? The uh, the crocodile hunter Steve, Steve Irwin. Irwin. He died of serotonin overdose from the from the uh, the uh, stinger of that stingray. Yeah, it's it's used in Scorpio uh, scorpion stings and spider bites, and a lot of them are using serotonin. They have associated chemicals, but serotonin is a major kill. I don't wow. think that's going to make me calm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just learned that methylene blue has an effect on serotonin. They say, like, yeah. don't combine it with SSRIs. Um, I think it lowers it, pretty sure. So. <laughs> Back in the day, they used to use methylene blue to get rid of golf sun. I really don't know how effective that is, but that was the story back in the 70s. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Everyone's looking for solutions to this, you know, current uh, flu that's going around. And um, the more I research, it seems like everything knocks it out. I know you emphasize uh, sugar and coffee, right? <laughs> yep, yep. Without getting in trouble, there's a lot of ways to deal with that. And and the funny thing is, it's a uh, it's a common cold. It's uh, the well, I don't want to go into it and get you in trouble. So uh, I I'm on I'm on Miwi and other places where I talk about that <laughs> without getting in trouble. <laughs> Do you, you have some ebooks on it, right? Or or did you write anything on it yet? Or on uh, serotonin? Oh no, on the current uh, flu going <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, I do. I have uh, I you know, nobody buys it because there's other information. That is an unusual information. Now I have some new things in uh, one of my recent books called The World Serpent. Uh, mm. that uh, that has some detail. Have I sent you a copy of that? Oh if not I'll no. We'll send you a copy of that. Yeah, there, there's a lot going on that people don't realize where the problem really is coming from. And basically, mostly in our situation, people are mopping up the floor instead of turning off the faucet. So I'm more interested in turning off the faucet than mopping every day than any type of health situation or political situation. So that's where I go to see the gestalt and where it's really coming from and not our sock puppets out there telling us stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really the the fear uh the the fear kind of bug. Um it's amazing how how many people are uh have that you know in them. It's just the overwhelming fear and they just submit because of that to the authority <laughs> that has the solution. Started with seat belts. I can still talk about seat belts and complain about it. Because I come from an era when we didn't need seat belts. In fact, we used to take road trips and change drivers while we were driving <laughs> one over the other one. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of a lot of rules and regulations that actually are counterproductive. And you take uh, mothers against uh, mad drivers. Okay, you stop the accident from one drunk. But meanwhile. People have to come to and fro to court, including the defendant, including the judge and everybody. So now you have 10 times more people taking traveling cars, upping the chance of you getting uh, in, a, in an accident. So people don't think of the gestalt. They always think of the one thing. And this is the same with medicine. If you, if you target the kidney and make it do something, what happens to the liver? What happens to the brain? What happens to, to the adrenal glands? They don't think that way. They only think we're going to affect this one organ and put it totally out of context. So hmm. that's modern medicine at its uh, worst. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It, 
I, I was recently uh, car shopping um, where I bought my, my diesel and I was looking at all the new 2021 cars and it's scary because it, it feels like we're going towards minority report. Like they all have the lane autocorrect where it reads the lines. All of them are GPS tracked. And I think newer cars are actually going to have cameras in the dash, like making sure that you're alert while you're driving. And I, it seems like we're definitely moving towards like self-driving cars. Like that just seems inevitable. And uh, hopefully they don't make older cars illegal. <laughs> You know, I come from an era where we roll down the windows with a crank <laughs> and where I could go and change the battery or do the oil or the transmission fluid easy. I just got under it, jacked it up, got under it. Now they even make a weak jack so you can't do it. You know, you have to go to the official have it go up like that. So I think they've actually made the car much more complicated. I, I could go buy a car off a car lot, a used car lot, for uh, two weeks' pay. Try to do that now. Two weeks pay goes drive a drive go to the the, the uh, get a car maybe five or ten years old that ran fine off a car lot and if you were selling it individually fifty bucks for a car <laughs> and you could drive around try to do that now basically they want people off the roads except for people who have money that's why in 2020 the road accidents went up because they had these cars going at uh, 100 miles an hour, there's no traffic, I'll speed along. So the car accidents went up, oh. the speeding tickets went up, and uh, a lot of them got away with it because there was no uh, no cop there. They were too busy uh, enforcing masks. And uh, the, the thing is now, they're going to increase the roads for those few people that do that, when if they just let the roads alone, you'd have automatic speed bumps. Why pay for speed bumps when you can just let the road deteriorate and then drive along at 20 or 30 miles an hour uh, on road trips? I had no mind, no problem when it was 55. Remember, they just set it at 55. But I would do something most people didn't do. I'd read a book while I drove. <laughs> I would cut them down. You take a, a paperback. I don't have an example here. Cut the binding and fold them in half. And then I would flip road book, road book. I read an entire book between Tucson and El Paso one time. <laughs> and perfectly safe because you know you have to be extra alert and watch for anything uh, crossing the road or a car veering or whatever. So I would look like that. And of course, every time I got to a stoplight, there I was. I could read a whole page, you know, flip it over to the next page, put it behind it. I'd have uh, about 20 pages at a time. That's 40 pages of reading. And then go to the next batch when I drove along. That's amazing. Yeah, I saw a video of a guy falling asleep in his Tesla. He got he, he had his Tesla self-driving and uh, he got pulled over by the cops. It was <laughs> I think I saw that video too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going too, too far. I, I, you know, Google is appreciated in getting places rather than the old roadmap they had to expand and get from AAA. But uh, there's a lot of side effects, too. And now what happens is not only the government, but the uh, large corporations have access to Google Instant. So they can look at your house and see if uh, after the man leaves home, the guy shows up. They can blackmail people from all of that. They can. They not only have infrared, they have infrared blue, infrared orange, infrared everything. They can tell how long your car has sat there by the heat of it, if it was just moved a half hour ago or whatever, they can x-ray through and watch body heat and see where you are in the house. All of that stuff, uh, there was a movie with uh, Gene Hackman made like that, and except it was all accurate except for the fact that the human people to keep up with the technology would be difficult. Now with AI, though, they can do it. If they want to target a certain person for anything, they can go and basically review their whole life like a time machine and get every little thing like a, a fishing license, expired fishing license is something that's come up with. And I won't go into that, but we'll get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm concerned about the 42,000 satellites that Elon Musk wants to, to launch and what their capabilities will be, because I feel like the story is more than what we're being told, right? More than yep. just high speed internet. <laughs> Definitely more. And here's the other thing. Think about it. Uh, they have to do all these things to disguise those satellites because they're so bright. They interfere with uh, city lights and all kinds of things. So 
But the technology, all these 42,000 satellites have to be in constant communication by laser with the ground, with the person, and with each other. Now, we're talking 42,000. What are they traveling at? 28,000 miles per hour? Zing, zing, zing. Meanwhile, Russia is putting their system up. China is putting their system up. Other countries have their system up. And there's space debris because even though a lot of those those satellites are designed to fall to Earth, you know, they have a little propulsion, they fail often. So you're risking explosions, all kinds of things, and interfering with Elon Musk's idea to get to Mars. He's going to have to go through a basically a, a network of satellites to get there. But they can't give us solar power, some stable ingot that they were actually saying in 1952 in Reader's Digest, that if they wanted, they could convert the whole civilized world into solar power in one year. What happened to the technology since 1952? Are we going backwards? So obviously we're being lied to. Yeah, absolutely. I I laughed at Elon's uh, quote I read. He's like, um, if I have the choice of being buried on Earth or on Mars after I die, I would choose Mars. It's more fun. <laughs> Some people say he wants to go there to see if this is really a matrix. Like in the, well, I like in the movie The 13th Floor. Did you ever see that movie? I still have to see it. That's on my list because of you. But. I highly recommend it. Yeah, it's really interesting. So he has that kind of idea that if you go beyond a certain stage, there might not be anything existing. This or it could be like a Truman Show, that kind of thing. So. Uh, Anyway, he's an interesting guy, but I think he's definitely connected with the government. He gets his funding from the CIA and DARPA and all that. Otherwise, he wouldn't be doing anything he's doing. I think he already has Neuralink in his head. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. That's another thing where it makes me nervous about him. Mm -hmm. That'd be a wild card, right, if um, everyone started getting Neuralink. I mean, that that's my theory currently. I mean, I'm open. I, I don't pretend to know where this is all heading. but. I mean, if they could put a, a cheap Neuralink in everyone's head and everyone, you know, lines up like an iPhone for it um, mm -hmm. and then use that grid of satellites we we're just talking about to activate them somehow. I mean, you could have like literal robots, right? <laughs> Remote control. That's the whole role of medicine, too. They claim they can, uh, by satellite, they can control your blood pressure, give you drugs and give you that. And now, you know, I'm into chronobiology and the timing of circadian rhythm. The latest thing now, they claim to have a drug that will, that an implant that will allow you to fly every place without being bothered by circadian rhythms. That is extremely dangerous and where it's going. You will be implanted drugs. I even had a friend back 10 or 15 years ago, they put an implant in his brain to release serotonin so that he wouldn't uh, be uh, suicidal or have problems along that line. And of course, it didn't work. He fortunately didn't commit suicide, but he didn't fix him from his major depression. And they think that one little link uh, going into like circadian rhythms is going to solve the problem. It's much more complex than that. And they want to tie it into genetics. Frank A. Brown was the real tech, the father of biotechnology, uh, of, uh, of circadian rhythms and chronobiology. But he, was taken over in a palace coup at Cold Springs Laboratory in Long Island so that they would say that it was genetic, that your timing was, was regulated by genes. Yet they can't explain how red blood cells can be timed without any access to genes. And they not only have no genes, they don't even have mitochondria in you know, a red blood cell, but yet they keep timed. So anyway, there's a lot of lies going out there to protect the genetic industry when actually it's a very minor part of disease. Hmm. What What are your thoughts on uh, blue light blocking glasses? Because those blew up, I think, in the last five years. And um, uh, like, do you think you could secrete melatonin even with the exposure of blue light at night? I remember hearing Jack Cruz say once that an orgasm creates instant melatonin release. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, there are other ways to get melatonin, but even Ray Pete will agree with me that melatonin is not a bad chemical. It's only when you interfere with its process. What is melatonin made of? Tryptophan and serotonin. That's what you want to get rid of the problem. 
So when your body is making it into melatonin, it's detoxifying it. But when you add melatonin, or in many cases, uh, uh, foods that are too high in melatonin, you interfere with it. And also, melatonin is not a sleep chemical. It's actually a chronobiological chemical. Because when is a rat's brain highest in melatonin? At night. Is it asleep at night? No, rats are active at night. So obviously it can't be a sleep chemical. Anyone have, going to sleep with melatonin that swears it works is having a placebo effect. It doesn't do that. So anyway, you, your melatonin, uh, you don't really want to stop it at night because it's converting serotonin. However, GE originally, back in the 1910s and 1920s, designed the incandescent light bulb to be low enough on blue light so to be imitative of the, the, the fireplace because fires have been around in human experience for thousands and thousands of years. So basically all you need is an incandescent light or a yellow bug light. That's what we usually use. And then we use red lights too. That, that's all you need. And then go to sleep in the dark and you have no problem. So you don't need all these blue blockers and everything. And certainly not during the day. You want that blue light a day to time your rhythm. And it's particularly between 1130 and 12 o'clock high noon. That is the optimum time to get maybe 20 minutes of sun to get the optimum amount of vitamin D in your body or your food. You can put your food out at that time too. Uh, see, vitamin D in pill form, it can't be vitamin D because it has a shelf life. If it only lasts for a winter in my body, how can it last in a pill for a year or two or three or four? It can't. And how come you can take pasta and put it out in the sun and activate the vitamin D for a week or two and then get all your vitamin D from things like pasta? If you want D2, you eat a vegetable product. If you want D3, you eat a meat product that's been exposed to the sun. And then you get full spectrum vitamin D. When they do it, they take one frequency, the greatest one, and expose it to one. And that's why they call it toxical. If you look it up, it's toxical. It is not uh, called vitamin D to a chemist because it's toxic. Mm. Mm. Did you ever hear the story? I think it was like two twin girls that were raised pretty much in an attic by their family. I think it was in Europe or something. And they were, you know, they'd never seen the sun for like, you know, besides through the window for like, I don't know, 15 years or something crazy. And um, they weren't in too good of health, but you know, their bone health and everything, but that was probably just missing the different colors of the, of the full spectrum light, right? It probably wasn't the vitamin D part. <laughs> you know, vitamin D, it's a mystery because uh, uh, the yogis who were buried alive for 40 days they stayed in the dark all the time, but they did drink donkey milk. It was the only one. And the British were so fascinated because they thought that was a bunch of bull. No one can be buried for 40 days. So they buried a guy for 40 days, had an iron guard. They buried him underground in a coffin, basically, covered it up with earth, put him in a stone shaft, and had sentries there day and night. And then they expected to take a corpse out, and he was alive. It took them about an hour or two to revive them. <laughs> and so they celebrated. But the British were so fascinated that the army did realize it was a carbon dioxide. And they did carbon dioxide tests and found out that donkey's milk was the highest in the carbon dioxide that this yogi was getting. It's, it's in the old books. You can actually find it on the Internet now, something I couldn't find in medical libraries before. So it's a very real deal. And there's... Vitamin D, just like like uh, Ray Peter said, if you had no oils in your body and could exist without them, you wouldn't need vitamin D. It's the oils that have to be handled by it. And oils can be very beneficial, your butter, your ghee, and things like that. But they can also cause problems if you have too much. And particularly, the more volatile they become, the more problematical they become. Unless it's so volatile, like malic acid and acetic acid that it changes from an acid in your stomach. <laughs> and it never gets any place except the alkali ash that goes along with it. it it's interesting that Ray's, Ray Pete is so pro uh, 
vitamin D supplementation and high dose. I've heard him say 50,000 IUs, really large doses. And people always ask me, you know, you don't agree with him on that? I'm like, no, I don't. And I, not one person doesn't have all the answers, right? That's usually what I tell people. It's like, I'm amazed at that because another thing, he, he said to avoid supplements or take them in very small amounts, take five milligrams of vitamin C, things like that, really small amounts. And uh, it's a mystery to me why he is. So, oh, take all the vitamin D you want, 50,000. Now, I know uh, I know people who are taking 50,000 international units of vitamin D, and it hasn't changed their levels at all. And according to science at one time, they said never take that much vitamin D over a week's time. Well, she's been taking it for years. <laughs> so, and the rest, But the levels don't change. And that's the studies I saw that no matter how much vitamin D they were giving people in hospitals, it wasn't increasing it. Because I think full spectrum vitamin D that you get out in the sun. And see, there's not much experiments like that. Only at the beginning when they wondered why you uh, didn't get the, what was it called? Uh, uh, they had a name, R the rickets effect. When people would get rickets, they'd get well with the sun. And they finally found out that whatever was in the sun, the anti rachitic effect, they could put in food and get rid of it. And that's when they actually had the time each food had to be in. Mushrooms are obviously really quick. Ten minutes of exposure of a mushroom, they load up with the other foods, pasta and things like that. Uh, the Italians who moved to New York, they always dried their pasta in the sun, and they were healthy. When the government said, you can't be drying your pasta on the rails of apartments, when they moved into apartments, multi-story ones, uh, they got unhealthy. And the Italians were smart enough to realize it. They shipped their pasta from Italy, because at least you would have enough of that vitamin D still left by the time it got there, even back in the 1920s when it took uh, like a month for it to get there. At least they had residual vitamin D still left in Because vitamin mm -hmm. D probably can last in a body. Uh, and the experiments were done for submariners. They're under, they're under the water for uh, three months. Do they need vitamin D? No. As long as they had the sun before they got in for the optimum time, it would last at least a month. Some people say three years, but I'm I'm conflicted about that. I'm not sure if it really will last in your body for three years. But three That's to six long. months, I think it does. It's not in the blood. If vitamin D isn't for your blood, it's for your fat. <laughs> what does it need to be doing in your blood? In other places, they mention they me measure. They don't measure it in the actual fat cell where it's doing its work or even stored. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Recently, I heard an analogy of like D3 converts to 25D, which is the one they measure. And then that converts to 125D. And um, I think it was on the Facebook group, uh, Jim Stevenson's group. There, It's one woman was saying that people are taking more taking in more flour, which is D3 when they already have um, or which is 25D when they already have enough bread, which is 125D, the active form. And so the bread starts filling up their house and filling up the rooms. Mm -hmm. And that actually makes infections worse. It kind of shuts off like uh, the innate immune system. Trevor Marshall talks about that in the context of like autoimmune disease. Then there are at least five or six other types of vitamin Ds they don't tell you about. One of the most researched is D4. But try and mm -hmm. have anyone talk about D4. But it's out there, I guarantee you. Any of your listeners can start searching the D4 and see that it exists. It's apparently prevalent in fish, but it's elsewhere too. So they have a lot of chemistry that they basically, they know that the American public can only handle one or two or three concepts at a time. So they keep the seven or eight out of the mix so that you can't think about that. You know, frankly, I even learned that in the health food industry. If, I, if a person would come in and say, where's your vitamin C? And I would say, here's one and here's another and here's another. And they would get confused and walk out the door. So finally, I learned if I was going to make a living in the health food business, they said, where's your vitamin C? I walked to the counter. Here it is. Nine out of ten people would walk out. Someone else would ask me, do you have anything else? I said, here. Okay. And they walk out with that because they thought I was trying to sell them my product. But the second choice would be good, which makes no sense at all. But I couldn't make a living unless I did that. <laughs> That's that's hilarious. Yeah, it's interesting how many people are looking for 
like I get questions every day, like, Matt, what do you recommend for um, psoriasis or for um, whatever X disease? And they want me to almost prescribe or recommend a product or a supplement. But um, it's really, to me, I'm, I'm learning it's about like electrolyte balance and getting the liver online, the adrenals, the thyroid, that connection. There, there's so many pieces, right? You can't really fix things with one supplement. <laughs> No, it, it's true. It's a multifactorial. Now, one thing, uh, thyroid. Uh, if you want to go to a uh, uh, to an element, thyroid seems to cure uh, uh, psoriasis. It's been used. Otherwise, sun exposure and salt water. Uh, many people go to the to the Dead Sea and get in that salt, and then uh, and then the low altitude, they get more of the ultraviolet radiation that's appropriate. And supposedly they have a 40% cure rate at the, at the Dead Sea. Now, I haven't validated that for sure, but it was in the science literature at one time. Even. That's really cool. Um, kind of jumping topics. I think in the last month, I've seen you make some, some posts about a hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Have you been researching that a little bit? You know, I was very fortunate that one of my best buddies, the leather tiger, George Wellington Adams, uh, was an expert as a deep sea diver around the world, trained astronauts and all that. He was an expert in the hyperbaric chambers. So yeah, I know a lot about it. Uh, I've never been in one though. I've, I've met people, I've been with chiropractors who had one. I just never made an appointment. But yeah, it can save, uh, for instance, if you need a blood transfusion and don't want to get one, if they put you in a hyperbaric chamber, you don't need a single red blood cell. You can pull them all out and survive because the pressure will drive it into the cell without a red blood cell. Now, that's just enough to relax you about two atmospheres of pressure. Uh, uh, the trouble with uh, hyperbaric chambers, I've learned, and that's been fairly recently, is the carbon dioxide. It, it needs to be either air or have some carbon dioxide in it because it does cause brain damage. But if you need to say uh, you're going to cut your leg off because of gangrene, and you can just go in a hyperbaric chamber without carbon dioxide. Guess which choice is going to be the smartest one? Go into the hyperbaric chamber because it will uh, save a lot of diabetics who are going to lose their limbs otherwise. It will. But if they just added Carbogen, which is a product available on the Internet and at various locations, you can add 3.5%, 5%, 7%, I believe, Carbogen to it. Mm your purposes three and a half percent i believe is the usual amount that uh is uh is therapeutic miners used to use it when they pumped oxygen down to mines they always made sure they had three percent carbon dioxide not three and a half they had three percent back then to protect the miners brains if they knew that back in the i found that in 1910 mining manual if they knew it back then they don't even know that today except Scientific American has re recently written three articles about it. So it's being well known. Interesting. Yeah, I've, I, I've been using it for about a year, and I uh, I had a lot of misunderstandings, misunderstandings about it, or like myths in my head that I thought were true. And um, mine only, it puts in compressed air, so it's just the same oxygen you would get. It's just higher air pressure. Um, but I think there's some like the therapeutic, like like the hard chambers you would find in like a clinic that are, you know, 100 grand or whatever. I think those can pump in 100% oxygen. And that's where it becomes dangerous, where like if you bring a lighter in there, you know, it could explode or something. <laughs> yeah, um, pressurized air is, the is your best bet because it's what you're getting right. anyway, pretty much. So uh, that's a good dose with a, maybe a little extra carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide... Uh, they used to heal people with it. You would, uh, you could mm -hmm. sit in a bathtub with it. In fact, in a major clinic in Germany, they had geysers of carbon dioxide coming out. They directed it by pipes into a public bath, so people would sit in the public bath or in the private tubs if they had more money, and be charged. Hundreds of people showed up for that. You didn't have to take your clothes off. The carbon dioxide went right through. You sat fully clothed in a bathtub, separate or in the, in the pool of carbon dioxide. You don't put your nose under because you're suffocating that, and you just right up to your neck. And they healed everything from uh, menstrual problems to
to cancer, to a whole bunch of diseases by using carbon dioxide back then. And easily find, found out on the internet. I sent, uh, I sent Ray Pete, uh, a copy of something off of that and he said, already read it. <laughs> he knew about it. He said, but then my copy was a little clearer than he was. So. Anyway. Yeah, I think uh, CO2 is so underrated. Like, uh, part of the reason why I wanted to homestead is to do things a little differently and I'm about to get more hens. Um, and I want to euthanize them in a, in a box of CO2 and, uh, just see, you know, if it affects the meat and, um, I, I haven't heard of anyone ever doing that. It's always, mm-hmm. you know, slit the throat or hack their head off, you know, on a, on a log with two nails or whatever. Um, but yeah, I found an article. It's the, it's the best way to, to euthanize poultry is just with carbon dioxide. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so. Yeah. And my parents said it the old fashioned way. In fact, I, I probably went toward the vegetarian side for a long time because I saw them cut off one rooster's head and he went running all around without a head. <laughs> I was inside and looking out the window screaming. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's pretty gruesome when you see that kind of stuff. <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah. I saw a carnivore recently that <clears throat> was collecting the blood from a, a, a chicken that was draining and just drank it. I guess that's a thing now. It's like drinking blood. I'm like it's probably a ton of iron, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the Maasai did that a lot. Though they don't, they don't live a long time. Like I said, they only lived about thirty or forty. Even then, now part of that was warriors. They did warriors don't live as long as other people. You know, they have a high attrition rate, and then they basically had to get what was there. Recently, I saw a documentary of the Bushmen of Tanzania who uh, they just get what's there. Uh, the guy went on a party with them and said they'd already lost 10 of their tribe to hunting accidents, but they eat uh, whatever they get. They eat the food, hair and all, like a squirrel, catch a squirrel, eat the whole squirrel. They, they raw, just pick it up and start biting through the, uh, just like a lot of, you see a lot of insects do that. The cats locally here are landlord's cats. They eat the mouse, uh, hair and all, the bird, whatever feathers all go down. Sometimes they throw up afterwards, but they don't bother to peel it or cook it or anything. But anyway, they, uh, the, uh, this one tribe of Bushmen has no conception of age. They don't know how long they live. They figure they are about 50 or 60. So when you don't have access to certain foods for a long time or water for a long time, all of their water is drank is mud. They, they dig into mud puddles and they drink it all just like it was normal. Like we, we go to great extents to distill our water, and they just go dig down in the mud till they get a little, sop it up, and put it in their lips with the mud and all. I guess they get their minerals that way. <laughs> Have you seen people drinking gasoline? I think it was somewhere in Africa or something, or, or they couldn't get water. He was literally guzzling gas straight from the pump. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I had a friend that was addicted to, when I was in grammar school, he was addicted to smelling gasoline. And God knows what that did to his liver, though. It's really tough on the liver. Yeah, he, he went around and to to other people's cars and they opened the gas tank before they had locks on and just inhale and take big uh, inhalations of it. Uh, I don't even know if he's still alive today. It was a long time ago. You know, I, I growing up, I loved that smell. Maybe that explains a lot. <laughs> It, it didn't, uh, you know, back then it was part of the deal. You didn't uh, have a warning sign from the gas station. You just breathe it in. Of course, it had lead in then, too. <laughs> uh, I don't regard lead as quite the problem they make it out to be. As long as you're having three bowel movements a day and your body is working pretty well and you're eating whole food, you'll dispose of it. Same with mercury. It was so, you know, uh, Lincoln used mercury for 20 or 30 years for his syphilis. A lot of people didn't know he had syphilis. <laughs> But finally, he realized it was affecting him after two decades, and so he cut back because he was having head problems. Uh, what's that book about the Mad Hatter's disease, you know, from uh, getting too much mercury? So uh, these toxic metals will cling out. They say that they cling, they're in there forever. That's just not true. If you eat on time, you use circadian rhythms, bowel movements. I sometimes have seven bowel movements a day now, like a, a, a wild animal, you know. You don't see animals, even a lion in a zoo fed nothing but meat. They did the experiments for about moments a day. I'd like to see humans do that. 
The doctor says, oh, if you have one every three days, you're fine. Uh-uh. Kellogg went into that in an extent and said that most people are way behind in their bowel movements, and that's why they're having so much problems. Maybe, but maybe that's how they have a crappy outlook on life too. <laughs> it's up in the brain, no brain blood barrier. Because <laughs> it it balances our hormones, right? Because I learned about from Ray with the fiber of the raw carrot and you know bamboo shoots or cooked mushrooms that there's like an estrogen, even a serotonin detox, and so yes. each time you have a bowel movement, you're you're kind of creating hormonal balance, right? In a way. Yeah, particularly foods have dietary fiber. If you eat the fiber in the fruit, but when you add other fibers, you can get problems. Now, eating it out of time can make a difference. Uh, I used to work out at the gym with a high school teacher, and he was taking O'Brien. So I said, why don't you take that at, instead of breakfast, which he was, I uh, take it at lunch because it, it'll make you go to the bathroom more often. So about two weeks later, I saw him at the gym and said, how's that working out for you? He said, I can't take it then. I said, why? It makes me fart. <laughs> I said, well, that's what it's supposed to do. The brain is supposed to pass that gas and toxins out. I'm a teacher. I can't be sitting in front of my students farting. I'm taking it in the morning. But oat bran will actually be counterproductive in the morning. But if you do take a little in midday, not too much, uh, my mentor, Adana Lay, warned me about oat bran. And I said, it's water soluble. And he just said, be my guest, which is always, you knew you were in for trouble. Six months later, I read in the paper, surgery on man who eats oat bran because he got caught in a small intestine. And then by one year, I read there have been so many cases of people having small intestine surgery from eating oat bran that doctors were warning people, if you take it, do not take more than a quarter of a cup and always take at least eight ounces of water with it and a glass, eight ounce glass afterwards and don't take any more was in the paper. So people have to be really careful when they buy these products like that. But a prune is 25% uh, dietary fiber. I believe a kiwi is too. Uh, a lot of foods have high percentages of fiber in them naturally. And mm. that's the best way to take it. And a carrot, of course, is really rich in fiber. Mm. Um, what do you think about oatmeal? Because recently I've been speaking out against plant plant based milks, which are huge right now. I did I, I had no idea, but it seems like ninety percent of people are using almond milk or oat milk or hemp milk in their shakes. I was shocked. It's like trending. Um, and people asked, you know, since I'm against those milks, they were like, "Well, what about oatmeal?" And I kind of did some research, and it seems like it's as long as you can digest it it's not much of an issue right like overnight i guess you could soak them overnight and that helps make them more digestible that that's my understanding if you keep it to a minimum and eat the oats now the oats were really popular in northern england and the people in london criticized them. but the scott said we have better men and better horses than you guys do because we eat our oats so you're feeling your oats so i believe that part of Northern England produced some of the greatest strong men in history out of that, including the Scottish uh, Apollo, who was, can you imagine someone can lift an elephant? He got on a platform and, and did a, 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 a like a, a squat, what do you call it? He lifted the elephant from a squatting position onto a standing with a rider on it, with a harness on it. The Scottish Apollo was one of the strongest men on earth. and. Oats were part of it. He was a vegetarian, by the way. <laughs> there, there's an entire bodybuilding community in England that uh, eats nothing but they're vegetarians. They're modeled after a man called the Great Gama, who was not a vegetarian. He ate mm -hmm. lots of almond, but he ate lots of meat, too. Have you heard of the mighty Gama? Mm -mm, this guy, he, he wrestled trees, and he was undefeated. He was in 4,000 matches and was the strongest man. He did gamma push-ups, which were like uh, very involved push-ups, gamma squats, a thousand in the morning, a thousand of this, a thousand of that. He was uh, one of the strongest and most fit men in the world. And he was the guru of a man called the Mighty Adam, who was Joseph Greenstein in this country. 
if you want to find some videos of Joseph Greenstein or his son at 94 pulling a uh, pulling a car, uh, a, a, a train, a train down the track with his strength, and also holding a plane back with his hair, with his long hair, he tied it to him. He warned someone else not to do that stunt because he had conditioned his scalp and the guy's entire head ripped off and killed him, or his entire hair ripped off and the skull attached to it. I mean, the hair, flesh attached to the skull. So, yeah, wow. he, you know, he could bite dental mirrors in half, railroad spikes. He had the strongest teeth, the strongest body. The Mighty Adam, check him out. He's an amazing character. There's a couple of videos on him on YouTube. Oh, the Mighty Adam? Or the Mighty it? Adam. He, he, A-T-U-M. I'm the timely Adam. He's the Mighty Adam. <laughs> yeah, here's what happened. The story is so unique. People should really check into it. He uh, was dying of TB. He overheard the doctor telling the mother that he's only got to last a few more years. So he snuck into a circus tent where he uh, where he got beaten up for getting in there. But the strong men found out about it, saw him lying there beaten up. So he said, who did this to you? And his eyes were so beaten up he couldn't even see. He said, but I know his voice. So he had everybody talk, and then he beat the guy up that beat him up and fired him. But then he said, you want to travel with me? And he said, yeah, go get permission from your parents. So he left, didn't tell his parents, but packed up a rucksack full of rags so it looked like he had his stuff back. said, okay, I'm ready to go. Went from the uh, whatever country, uh, uh, Bulgaria, something like that, all the way to India with him. And the person, the strong man who uh, taught him how to breathe and lift things at one time, and he got rid of his uh, tuberculosis completely, became a strong man and studied with the great Dharma in India as well. Went to the United States and walked into a pharmacy one day, and a man, a crazy man, picked up a high caliber revolver and shot him as four feet away right in the middle of the forehead well the mighty adam went to the pharmacist and said have you got something for this <laughs> about pain you made the headlines of the houston paper and uh, but then he said there's something different about me and the strong man had told you one day you will find out so using willpower he not only could bend the horseshoe he then could rip them apart and his biography is the stunts he did. I could go on and on for an entire show of what he did. I was fascinated with this man when I found out about him and all the things that he did in his life were just remarkable. He was only like five foot tall, too. Wow. Yeah, I found his Wikipedia, Joe Greenstein, and it I says did. he come to cancer in 1977 at the age of 84. Yep. Yep. Maybe Crazy. he didn't know about... Is, it sounds amazing. I guess not. I guess not. His uh, son lived to 94, 96, something like that, and was a strong man, too, in the tradition. So, but he, but he did do, he could even, uh, he would do stunts like, uh, tie me in front of a chair, he would say, on the road, middle of the road with chains, and, uh, and then come at me at 70 miles an hour top speed, right at me. And he would, break the chains with his the the combination of his teeth and his breathing capacity and jump off the chair well he miscalculated and the car hit him on the foot and tumbled him through the air but he survived that and another time uh. the guy gave him an, a uh, what do you call it you take a railroad spike and you do something hard in the steel so when he was going to bite it on stage he realized that it was something you can't bite through, supposedly. But he gave his word, so he bit through it anyway and lost four teeth in the process. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Um, let's let's jump into the Q&A if you're okay with that. Um, oh, yeah, some... yeah. We went on too long. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a lot of interesting questions. Um, what are your thoughts on taking periodic breaks from caffeine a couple of times a year? like for two months do you think it's necessary i think i might have asked you this in a previous episode if 
if you think it's necessary to take breaks from it. You know, uh, there's something to be said for that to make sure you're not allergic. And usually the time to tell if you're allergic is three months uh, for that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Sometimes just to make sure I'm not going to have caffeine withdrawal problems, I, I do it about five days. Because mm -hmm. if, if in five days you have withdrawal symptoms, and if you get back on it after five days, you'll have a reaction, you can tell. So the most mm -hmm. I've ever gone is about a week at a time. So, but uh, caffeine, you know, coffee isn't necessary for health. A lot of people don't drink coffee and they're healthy. I didn't drink it until I was advised to drink it in my 40s. And at that time, my mentor, Donald Lay, say drink it only on Mondays and Fridays. And Thursday. So we asked why Monday? Because you have your major amount of heart attacks on Monday when people come back to work. And it's a mean that affects everybody, whether you go to the bank on a Sunday, all that kind of stuff. And so you have your most stress on Monday and the most stress on Thursday, the day before you get your check, right? When you work for the man. So I wow. started for the first year, just drank it on Mondays and Thursdays. Then Kabbalah Mantana came along, and I started drinking more and more. And now my minimum is close to a quart a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, love it. It. I love your picture where you're holding the huge mug of uh, the Kabbalah Mantana. <laughs> right, right. You know, I think uh, I'm actually going to cut down on my coffee a little bit to about half a quart a day because I think when you do have a problem, Otherwise, you have to go too far above that to deal with the problem. So I think uh, two cups or so a day is fine, two or three cups. And when you want to go past that, like one time when I had the flu, I drank two quarts a day, loaded with sugar, and I never got it. I started to get it when I, I said, this is crazy drinking this to prevent this. And I started to get the flu. That was when Vibrant Gal was so sick. I thought she was going to die. We were. Uh, we were evacuees from uh, the, the floods here. We we're up in a ranch all by ourselves. There was no help. So I had to figure I had to be the feeder. I had to drag her to the bathroom back and forth. And, uh, we had a desk chair, fortunately, for the kitchen table. Put her, managed to get her on that and roll her into the kitchen. And uh, I mean, into the bathroom. Yeah, it was serious. She couldn't eat anything. But, wow. Uh, but I gave her sugar and eggs. Finally, when she finally she could eat four eggs, it got down her, and I knew she was on the road to hell. <laughs> she's been really fine, and she's eating sugar these days, not as much as me, but she does. <laughs> yeah, I feel like if people just added sugar with their coffee, because people have been taught to do the bulletproof thing or keto, that the sugar really balances it, right? Like you say, sugars that breaks. Even Ray Pete says that, that you can get them problems mm -hmm. drinking black coffee. So, mm -hmm. so I found that. And sometimes I even put a little whole cream in it. We get raw cream mm -hmm. here, so I add that to get a little uh, balance in it. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, how much protein do humans need and in what form? You know, there's a controversy on that. And uh, here's what I found from the Heritage Seed Company. Some researcher found that no one had ever tested for free-form amino acids in vegetables. That only checked for protein. And of course, I used to sell injectable-grade amino acids to bodybuilders because it was the purest you could get. They didn't inject it, but it was purer than the regular free-form amino acids. And they were really expensive. So our health food store did really well with it. But then I found out from this guy that vegetables, raw, have those free form amino acids just like you buy in a supplement form. Injectable, right, if you will. And the, and the best is tomatoes. So now just to make sure, I eat a lot of tomatoes. And so far I've done, done pretty well with them. Uh, but I, I noticed when I first went vegetarian, I got weak, whether it was psychological or not. I don't know, but I think, uh, I think it's about balance. So I went down for the first time in a couple of years and had a Carl's burger this Saturday <laughs> for breakfast even. I ate it at the wrong time to stimulate my body. 
That's amazing. Yeah, I had Chipotle for the first time in a really long time the other day. <laughs> it's good to test the system every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. But I, so I think it varies uh, in your health. Uh, I, I think I'm looking for more of a source of the protein. Eggs are really good. They have a lot of protein in them. And every once in a while, I even will have an anchovy. But that's about once a year. Uh, just to uh, test it out in my body to see how it does because they're really high in omega three, not a good choice. Even Ray Pete, I'm surprised on a recent show, they recommended once in a while it's okay to have a fish, not gonna not gonna kill you once in a while. It's when you have a lot of them and your body can't keep pace of them. So mm-hmm. if someone out there really likes a salmon uh, and they want to have it once in a while, great. They're better off with orange ruffy. Because the orange ruffy is the lowest in, in omega threes, but it lives to three hundred to two hundred years, one hundred and fifty according to Wikipedia. Ray Pete says there's cases of two hundred. They live that long. Don't start reproducing till twenty. Look at a salmon. If they live nine years, they're really fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone asked, "What does he know about breatharians?" <laughs> you know, I really believe they exist, but I think most of them out there are phony. Because when you, uh, I I won't mention one's name, but one of his, my clients was his girlfriend, and she ratted him out about McDonald's hamburgers and all kinds of things. And late, later, someone else ratted him out. He was on on the news, but that guy was unusual. He was really skinny, but he could lift weights that boggled the brains of bodybuilders. They couldn't figure out how he, how he could be so skinny and be so strong. So he did have certain talents that even he ended up in bodybuilding magazines. Uh, again, I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, but I think there is such a thing. I think people have accessed it from what I know, but I think it's, uh, I, I don't know if I've ever met a person who's a breatharian or an actual breatharian. Lots of claims. You'll find many on the internet. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like they say they get their energy from grounding and and light, right? And breath. That's kind of the combo there. <laughs> Similar. A Donald Lay's technique was you take, I'm going to show you uh, kind of what I can with my head here. You take this hand and put it on your leg and you go <laughs> three times. And then you bring your leg back to center <laughs> three times. You do that three times. The other leg three times. Then you do that to your arm and your arm and your neck. And after three times, he said, that's the beginning of learning how to live without eating. Hmm. So, wow. I think I, ha- I actually have that technique written in one of my books. Uh, I'll send you a copy of it in case you want to experiment with it. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I was almost going down that road, like 23 hours a day fasting and I was jacked, but I think my stress hormones were really high. And that could have just been the context of my life at that point. But uh, my cortisol and adrenaline was definitely jacked up when I was uh, eating for one hour a day. <laughs> my long fasting were like a gallbladder fast where you had a lot of olive oil. So it had mm. uh, olive oil and apple juice. That gave me sugar and fat. But I found in my first week of doing that, uh, I lost five or 10 pounds. And in the mm-hmm. second week, I put it all back eating the same diet. When I got to the 10th day, I took some Beeler's broth because I was starting to get some weird feelings at that time. So I went for 14 days before I realized it was so easy for me. I was concerned about what the long-term effects would be. So I finally said, I got stuck. And it was hard. After that much time, it was hard for me to get my body on to do that. That's why they say the most, the best fasts are three days on till your body starts shutting down, feed it something, three days fast again, and then your body isn't busy shutting down because otherwise it just goes into dormancy and you don't cleanse anything. So that's Mm -hmm. supposed to be a really tough fast. I pretty much gave up fasting for eating on time and used my Mm -hmm. fasting for semi-fasting during the night. But if I get up to go to the bathroom, teaspoon of sugar, or even a little coffee sometimes and sugar. That's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, the craziest one I did was a watermelon fast. I think it was seven or 14 days, but I felt amazing. And it's 
funny learning about nitric oxide now because it has the L-citrulline amino acid that jacks up your nitric oxide or converts, mm -hmm. you know, arginine and it has that relationship. Uh, but I felt great. I was like juicing the rind of the watermelon, the whole thing. <laughs> you know, uh, because it's so high in sugar, uh, it's protein sparing at the very least. Mm. Now, if there are also uh, preformed amino acids in there, you have something else going for you. So it's my mentor warned us about water fast. That was what was too toxic because you didn't know whether the toxins were going to be driven out of your body or into your bones. In other words, you couldn't control the direction unless you really knew what you were doing. So he said city people are particularly toxic and should be really careful with the water fast. Other type of purges he was uh, not really a fan of, but he wasn't too concerned of doing the old, uh, what was it, the lemon juice and a little cayenne and the maple syrup and those kind of things. Uh, those things, I know people who have done them, they haven't had much results, so they've usually lost body mass and things in the long-term ones I've seen happen. But I think it, I think it varies again between some people get away with a lot of that stuff, and some people it can be beneficial for you know turns on the organ system. So I'm not going to knock it. Mm -hmm. I've done it. Yeah, the, <laughs> the master cleanse, I think that was called. Yeah, yeah the master <laughs> cleanse. That was the one. He ended up in jail for killing someone. They said because someone died who did it. Now people die all the time. You go in the dock in a medical. Uh, facility, you're likely to die more so than that. But they they put him in jail with no possibility of parole because he would just murder someone again with his bad advice. That's our medical police state in action. Wow. Um, someone asked, can you break down the fruitarian community's mucus myth? Um, mucus is it's protective, right? Yeah, it protects you. So uh, one time, I, I knew Gypsy Boots who really was a pioneer. And he said, sometimes people need a little more mucus. <laughs> so he, and, and he ate a lot of fresh fruit and things like that. So uh, uh, I don't know. I think he was a vegetarian, but he was certainly active into his 80s. And uh, a guru to Michael Douglas and to his father, Kirk Douglas, who did pretty well. I think he lived to 103 and his wife to 102. And uh, they know a lot about health food because Gypsy Boots was a friend of theirs, gee, back in the 40s, I think, or 50s. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, mucus protects you. And all of those pictures you see of these things inside colons, I would call up like uh, uh, coroners or uh, people in, uh, what do you call them, mortuaries, and ask them, uh, when you go into corpses, do you find all this stuff? And they thought I was crazy. <laughs> no, well, where'd you have that? But I would pretend I was a college student doing a thesis on it. And I talked talk to operating room nurses that way. I'm doing a thesis on that. And they said, and they say, no, that's not true. But they do, when they go in, sometimes they find a lot of feces in there that they have to get through. But no plaque and all that mucoid plaque stuff that Bernard Jensen and other people have gone on and on about. You can get concretions in the colon. They do get blocked up, and I've taken x-rays of colons, and my own, instead of this type of colon, it's like, my, my, in my 40s, my uh, transverse colon was below my belly button. <laughs> I ate a lot of melted cheese and a lot of stuff I shouldn't have eaten, and uh, poopas, whatnot, tuna fish, and it paid a price. I only x-rayed one person who had that normal museum colon, yeah. It's like mm. that perfectly. Yeah, I, I saw this type of colon, you know, <laughs> all uh, like a, like spaghetti thrown on a, a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> That's what most people's colons look like. Mine wasn't too much better. <laughs> Spe speaking of accumulations, uh, uh, a little while ago, I got onto ear candling, just researching ear candling, and watched like tons of YouTube videos on it. And I know they sell those at health food stores, and there's like 90% of the YouTube videos on ear candling is it's a hoax. And then it shows that, you know, the stuff that when you open the candle, it's just the wax, of the candle, it's not stuff coming out of the ear. I did find one where that a lady was saying it's the smoke that's giving the benefit. Like she had, she made no claim that it's pulling wax out of your ear, but that it's introducing small amounts of smoke, which is cleansing. 
Um, but I wanted to get your thoughts on ear candling because that's it's like a trend, right? Like uh, a lot of people are into that. It works, but if you just take an ear candle and burn it, you'll find that same wax. So it doesn't just eat the wax out, but it does make it more fluid and makes your ear expel it more. And I have a story about that. My aunt uh, was from Sicily, and she intermarried with a bunch of Swedes, as most of my relatives. And my uncle, Carl, went, was deaf in one ear, but then he went deaf in the other ear. And she knew how to do ear canceling from Sicily. This is back in the 1960s or something like that. And so she ear candled him. He got his hearing back perfectly. Last time when he was still alive and I saw him in the 80s, he was in, he was in his uh, mid 80s doing, doing one handed push ups and stuff. He was in great shape, but he could hear still out of that one ear. The other one, he had, had damage, physical injury to it. But so it actually does clear it. But when you see people who I'm reading your, your earwax. You ever seen those? There's, I've actually gone to sites and say, read your earwax. This says this is going to happen and this is going to happen. Like tea leaf reading, but ear leaf. But actually, it works. I was ear candle one time and uh, and it, it helped my hearing. Got, to, got rid of some earwax. And she warned me, when you go outside at altitude, it was in uh, New Mexico someplace, uh, don't let any wind get in there. And the slightest breeze, it would hurt your ears. So there was an effect, and I got a little uh, a little better hearing. I find my method is go in the shower, in a hot shower. And then you have to be very careful with this stuff. When, when it's really hot, the earwax will melt. Tilt it and take a, a Q-tip, but just put it around the outer edge. Never shove it in. You can, you can lose your hearing that way. Very dangerous. So I, I'm not going to recommend people do this unless they know exactly what they're doing. By the way, I know a person who had a hearing problem. And when my friend did, uh, it's a particular type of neck adjustment where you do, it's called a one pop method, whatever, out of alpha biotics. Uh, and a, the, the head of a Q-tip came out of his ear. <laughs> He was lucky he had wow. his hearing, but it actually popped out of his ear. <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, I used to scuba dive and get water clogged in my ear all the time. And I figured for that, it'd probably be amazing. Um, now, if that happens, I just use the bulb and I squirt like hot water and pressure to shoot yep. it out. But <laughs> my, my friend who lives up near with you, they're, they're all scuba divers, by the way. They've been all over the world. They have more filmage than custodians. Uh, they wow. went uh, under every every day, every other day, and took hours and hours of still pictures and moving pictures, huge catalogs of even even won film awards on a couple of their feeding shark videos and other videos like that. But uh, but so I was the only snorkeler on the uh, I wasn't approved when I went to Hawaii with them, but I got to get down to about twenty five feet. But at first, oh my God, my ears would hurt, you know, so I just gradually got used to it. Yawned and stretched a lot. And pretty soon I could go down 25 feet and actually hang out with them. In fact, my friend Greg said, you know, if you can go down like that with, with just a, with just a snorkel, uh, you can certainly learn to scuba dive. It's easier. <laughs> but I never did get my uh, license on that because of uh, other things intervened. Mm. I only went down I was, and the dive master took me down and it was really great experience. It really is a lot of fun. So you I'm yeah. sure you had a lot of adventures. I, I really miss it. Yeah, I need to get to Seattle and I don't know anyone up there, but uh yeah, I, I always wore the earplugs with the little tiny holes in them and that mm -hmm. helped tremendously for clearing and keeping water out when I was underwater. Right. Yeah, you um, have to be careful because the, the earplug if you go down with them, if it's totally plugged, you can break, bust your eardrum. You get the same kind right. of thing. People with cavities often have the air pressure inside the mm -hmm. cavity comes up and hurts them as they're coming up. And of course, you can just uh, hold your breath for two feet coming up and you can burst the lung. So <laughs> and I'm sure you know a lot more about that than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, gas embolism, I think it's called. I Yeah, I had a dry suit accident or at a used one and I shot up 
like a cork from 60 feet and coughed up some some brown phlegm and they tried to get me to the hyperbaric chamber and they're like yeah the bubble could pop in your brain years later and give you a stroke and all this stuff and i was like i'm fine <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great yeah most people <laughs> they have those kind of injuries and they really do great particularly uh, i was always interested in the science of yawning pendiculation mm -hmm. stretching and yawning and so when i when they were scuba diving i realized what a perfect way to study the effects of pressure on the body and so that's why I, I went and got all those Patty books or whatever they are out of the library and be studying all of them. I learned a lot about pressure. And for people's health, if anyone has a problem, they don't know what to do, start yawning and stretching a minimum of 30 times a day. Their health will improve no matter what the problem is. I don't care if it's cancer or a hangnail. <laughs> start yawning and stretching and you'll do a lot better. And you say sticking out the tongue helps too, right? That's another thing. And it'll, it'll enhance your ability to yawn too. You'll find you often yawn. Also, you can press on your body and you'll find certain points that will release. So when you press it, it'll make you yawn. Those are good points. And if you can watch the type of movie that makes you cry or uh, laugh or things like that, that also helps get rid of pressure. When we say we're under pressure, then we hold ourselves under pressure. It's like a can. You have a, a hole here, and you punch a hole here to make it flow. We have one on the south, on the north end, and one on the south end. And if both aren't working correctly, we get gas. That's a good. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> one woman came um, to me one time, and I told her she had gas, and she said, "I don't have any gas." I said, "Can I feel your abdomen?" Well, her abdomen was hard as a rock, and that's not fat. That's not. That's gas. So I said, you don't know the difference between having gas and passing gas. <laughs> Two very different things. I think that's why people get such a benefit from enemas is because it's just an instant gas relief, like you're opening the valve. <laughs> that can help a lot of people because the uh, many times shock goes into the anal muscle and you'll get more psychosomatic release. And, and I mean, psychosomatic means it affects your physical body. So uh, we often, uh, what do they say when soldiers used to go to get a name? They would say, call it the pucker factor, you know? Uh, they had different slang terms for that. And it's very real. A lot of trauma goes into that muscle. So just working with that muscle or even doing those tantra techniques where you not only can control your, uh, your uh, uh, sexual muscles, but your anal sphincter. And so many Qigong techniques and Tai Chi techniques are tied into the red dragon, the black dragon, the white dragon, all that kind of things are tied into that muscle. Very important muscle for brain health. Even. Hmm. Well, um, someone asked, what does Adam think of manganese and carotenoids role in the progression of lipofuscin? I, I would give them a minor role. And I would hmm. say... Uh, I think Ray Pete is more extreme about it because they are hoopas themselves. But carotenoids in moderation, I think, are beneficial. And certain people can't handle it. Here's the way you tell. If you drink a lot of carrot juice for a week and you start turning orange, you can't handle it. You're having a problem with it. So then it's not a good idea under most circumstances. There are some reasons to do it. But if you do like me, drink two quarts a day and never, I tried to turn orange. I couldn't even get my palms or anything to turn orange. My body was handling it fine. Also in iridology, you will find some people who store those carotenes in their eyes. It's actually orange pigments. And I first start, started studying carotenoids in the oil industry. I found to my amazement, there was more information on the carotenoids in eyes, in iridology, in oil books about how they relate oil to the various pigments in carotenoids, both the yellow ones, the orange ones, and the red ones, that uh, I was fascinated with it. So, yes, no, maybe. Hmm. Can, cancer uh, can turn off, uh, turn off it. Uh, other things can. And here's something people don't realize. As of 1948, two women at Vassar, I think, discovered that you can get retinol, real vitamin A, from baby vegetables. 
You can't get it elsewhere. And that it's the original source of animal retinol. So most people tell you retinol is an animal and carotenes are in and they convert. It's the opposite. Baby vegetables start with vitamin A and then they store it like we do with hypocarotenia as a storage deal. They store it better than we do. So uh, baby vegetables I'm talking about, actually very young vegetables. Some things are sold, stole, uh, sold as baby vegetables. They're miniature vegetables. That's not, that's not the thing you're talking about. Anyway, they won a Nobel Prize, I believe, for it, but it got forgotten. In the back, way back in 1947, there are so many cases of medical amnesia like that that just go under the bus and you forget all about them. That's one of them. So that's one that's way to get it where you don't have to uh, take meat to get or eggs or whatever to get your uh, vitamin A. You're making me excited for the greenhouse. That's that's pretty cool. And so people shouldn't think of baby carrots, right? Because you're saying those are not. And they're usually covered they're in chemicals. They're usually fake. Yeah, they're made. <laughs> but you can. You can get. If they're many, you pull them out and eat them, and then you get real vitamin A. Definitely. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, someone asks, how much damage can truly be reversed on an older person covered in age spots? Like, is there a point of no return? <laughs> you know, it's it's really difficult. Uh, science is claiming they can do it now, but they're affecting one system, and it can be hazardous to the rest of your body. Uh, I think there's no such thing as a lost case, and I think people can't regenerate. Uh, recently, someone asked me about cultivate, cultivating energy. Sometimes they call it cultivating chi. It's more in the, in the martial arts. And when you get to be 80, you start to think about that because that's what kills people. They run out of energy and the ability to take from the environment. The oxygen doesn't get utilized as much. The food doesn't get utilized. The lipoproskin builds up faster, those kind of things. So cultivating energy has always been fascinating to me, and I think it can be done. If this person that's aging and has the age spots devotes themselves to getting well, doesn't go for bother to watch too much Netflix or too much of this or too much that, life has a way of distracting us from energy. And uh, if you if a person really wants to get well and they focus and they really use a combination of common sense, internet, and expert advice, I think they can actually get rid of it. But for most people, ninety nine percent of people, forget it. Just keep more. Just keep more from building up because age spots in the face are in the heart, they're in the liver, they're in the brain, they're all over the place. And in fact. The the skin and the eyes for the lipoproskin, the so-called alien pigments in iridology, are indicators of shrunken heart disease. That's what they call it. Uh, shrunken liver disease, brown bowel disease. They're all forms of yellow fat disease. But I believe the, the metabolism can be revamped. And uh, if we got some kind of angel investor where I could really multiply myself I think I really could find a better, uh, have better results on aging than Aubrey de Grey and these other so-called life extensionists. I respect his work, but he's too much into, we're going to find a drug to do it. Sorry, not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're interesting people. And, um, I think lately they're like Dr. Cowan got the life extension people on the, the deuterium depleted water. And that's like a huge thing right now. And I think it, I mean, uh, Gabor Somalier wrote a book on deuterium depletion and cancer. And there's a lot of studies on that. I think for cancer, it's excellent. But for anti-aging, it's a really expensive strategy. So if you have money, great. Um, but I think there are a lot of more foundational things you can do, right? Like eating sugar. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's a, uh, number one, uh, Ray Pete, I agree with him on that. If you happen to live in the north or up in the mountains, you're going to get deuterium depleted water. But there are studies, you know, about five, six years ago, you wanted to get deuterium enriched water. And people in nuclear plants have drink have drank up to 20% and have no problems that they can find. So I think the whole thing is overblown on it. I wouldn't go go to a nuclear plant and say, can you give me deuterium enriched water? I'm not going to do that. But I think it's it's way overblown. Uh, 
certain people we've seen on YouTube have made a big thing about it, how to even take their ice cubes and do this long process and everything. I don't think there's enough bang for your buck for it being a very real thing. And uh, uh, so also, even with Ray Pete, who applauded it, but he said, get your beet sugar from Colorado at higher altitude, less deterian. But then what kind of fruits does he recommend? Tropical fruits. They're, in der- they're naturally deterium and rich. That makes no sense. To me, it's a zero-sum game. And so I don't really, I'm not really concerned about my deuterium level more than my fluoride level, my chloramine level, and tritium. That's, uh, that is a, uh, a subset of hydrogen I wouldn't be messing with in water. <laughs> Tritium water, that will kill you. I'm more <laughs> concerned about that. <laughs> yeah, they uh, uh they use that in, in gun sites. It's like a glowing uh glowing material that they paint on, on guns. <laughs> yeah, and that, 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 that does get in water. A lot of water is radioactive. They used to sell it as a benefit to your body. Right here you can mm-hmm. hike up in Sespe to these radioactive places that have it. They used to sell radioactive water that you would drink. It was in the 30s and 40s. They would enrich it. And even today, they have tours of radioactive mines so you can get a little bit of it. Strangely, there's truth to it. Rats kept under 65% more atomic radiation, uh, ionic radiation, than uh, rats that aren't exposed to it live longer than the other ones. This is called hermesis, and it's the J factor. Toxins actually can help us if we get a minor amount. So that's why I wouldn't I wouldn't go looking for a zero pupa diet. I would say eat a low one, and actually to a certain degree, you could eventually medicine will figure this out with the degree of that you can get away with for an average to exist. But many even so-called uh, antioxidants are actually done on hormesis. They're poisons. The antioxidants they talk about are there to defend the plant against herbivores. That's us a lot of times. Even if you're a meat eater, you're going to eat a vegetable with it. Uh, and uh, they're here to, uh, but they actually have an effect of hormesis of actually causing a stress, and then it turns your immune system on. You don't want to turn it on to constant inflammation, but you do want to turn it on, oh, I know that stuff now. I'm going to learn to control it instead of uh, be overwhelmed by it. Hmm. Is that, that's like polyphenols, right? Those are like um, things that Aaron Coffee people say are so good. Are the, those like that's a class of plant defense compounds? Yep. Guess what they used to call them? Tannins. <laughs> <laughs> then they would tell you how to get. How do you get the tannin out of your tea? Put a little <laughs> milk in it. It neutralizes it, and etc. Now suddenly, what is it? EGPT, I get mixed up with the alphabet soup of the initials. That's supposed to be the anti-cancer thing that works. It's not. The caffeine in tea also is the anti-cancer effect, according to Johns Hopkins. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. Um, We've had so many shows that I'm trying not to ask repeat questions, and I might have asked you this one in the past, (laughs) but are, uh, are freckles and moles on the skin related to lipofuscin? I think you did, and to, to <laughs> clarify it, yes, no, maybe. Uh, Ray Pete especially has done a lot of research in that department and found that a lot of people get freckles as kids and then get away with it, get, get past it when the hormonal condition goes away. So I, I wouldn't, freckled people shouldn't really worry about it, but yes, there's something to that. They have uh, almost a genetic deficiency of something. But it's not a major problem. It's not like the regular lipofuscin spots and aging spots you get. But it is something that is like a deficiency. Now, in iridology, I'm something called a, uh, you'll find I have a grayish pigment in my eyes. That means there's going to be gallbladder problems with certain things. So I, because of that, I eat a certain way to kind of adjust to that particular, particular type. Oops. I, yep, I'm still here. Wait a second. Did I get it right? They got it. Okay. <laughs> they give me that signal. Are you still here? Yes, I'm still here. Um, so, so anyway, uh, uh, they're, uh, uh, I wouldn't worry about it, <laughs> but just mm-hmm. stop 
eating freckles, I mean, stop eating uh, <laughs> omega-3s, I don't think they're going to go completely away. But there have been people who in their 40s or 50s suddenly lose their uh, freckles. So it hmm. does happen. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you always hear that. Freckles, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't lose sleep over the whole thing. <laughs> Hmm. I remember growing up and I think my parents, like my mom would say, you know, um, about moles, because I have moles in my body that you need to watch them if they change color or get lighter or something, because that could turn, they could turn cancerous, right, or into a melanoma. Um, but that's probably wondering how much of that is like a vitamin E deficiency and, and, and other things going on. Other things definitely go on. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the last interview, which uh, your viewers are on radio, right? They can't see. This mole was bigger. You notice that? That part of wow. it. Grew up. I put uh, I put coconut oil on this <laughs> this time. Before that, uh, I went down to uh, the farmers market, and a friend of Ivory Gal said, "What is that? A barnacle on your face?" So, so I went home. It was big then. I went and put uh, some healing salve on it. It's a particular combination that a friend of mine made. And most of it fell off. So it got smaller. But over the two years since that happened, I think it's been two years, it started growing back again. So then I thought, you know, I did it once. Let's see if I can do it again. So again, some of it fell off, but not the whole thing. Now, here's a really interesting thing. A really bad looking one right underneath that was there. And that was black and very irregular. And that's a, that can be a classic melanoma. And it was growing quickly. So what did I do? What did I do? I can think of what, what it was. Uh, I think it was castor oil, something like that, whatever that's supposed to work. I put it on it and it dropped off in one overnight. I woke up and it was gone, just like that. Wow. So yeah, they can change. That one, you can't see a trace of it. Also, when I was in high school, right here, you can't even see scars now, but on this side of my face, I had two moles and big black hairs growing out of it. Well, I went and got regular castor oil because I read about it from Edgar Casey. <laughs> so I went to the pharmacy, got regular deodorized castor oil, uh, castor oil, rubbed it on, and within a week, they were totally faded, but the black hairs stayed there. But you couldn't see it. You could see the bumps, and the bumps gradually went down, and after uh, 10 years, the black hair stopped, stopped growing out. So I can't even, I went there with a microscope or a, or a uh, magnifying glass about this caliber. Couldn't find a trace of it using a magnifying mirror and that thing. Can't even see where they were anymore. And they were prominent bumps, you know, how they bumps and then the darkness. So anyway, yeah, they can come off. Now here, well, I got to tell this story. Francis Bacon. Was was a <laughs> vibrant gal's laughing because this is a great story. Fra Francis Bacon is a uh, epitome of science. Scientists say the scientific method was delineated by him. No superstition. Well, he was born with five or six childhood molds, but then when he got to be a scientist, he got a uh, a large one on his face, and so he became concerned about it. So. His friend said, no problem. She, she took a piece of mutton and stuck it on his face, rubbed it in really good, then took it out and waited for the full moon and exposed it to the full moon. And the mold dropped off and its five childhood molds dropped off. It's in Bacon's writings. I've quoted it many times. So is that the oh. mind? Is it the mutton? Is it the moon? What the heck is it? But something happened with those molds. So anything can cause anything, and anything can cure anything. So if you have a method that works, keep doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible! Wow. Yeah, I remember years ago I heard of Paul Neeson, the raw food guy. He was recommending black salve, and I'm so glad I didn't order it because his he had videos of like burning out his moles, and it created this deep crater in the skin. I'm like, that looks like it'd take years to heal. Like it looked like they just like like you almost cut out the mole. I'm like, that's, that's a little, it looks like it hurts. <laughs> so. I tried it on this. And it, <laughs> it, it made me nervous. It turned bright red. It was definitely an irritant. But I'll tell you a story. And I don't know if this is psychosomatic or not. 
my good friend Judy Utley, she came to me and I gave her a uh, a line. I won't call it an adjustment because I get in trouble on her neck. And her left eye drooped. The eyelid came down. So she said, what is this? I said, I don't know. I, I was very gentle with your left neck. So she went to the doctor. And the doctor said, how did you even walk in this office after the test? You have spinal cancer. You have lung cancer. You have breast cancer. Go home and get your affairs in order. You're lucky if you make it the week. That's the exact words. So she went home, came over to our place first, was really depressed. And I thought, she's going. Well, she decided to fight it. So there were these two ladies in San Antonio that did that. They burned a hole that large, nine inches across, maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe six inches across, burned a crater in her back. Her cancer went away from the lungs. Cancer went away from the spine. Cancer went away from everything. And she went on for uh, year after year, getting test after test. They were desperate to try and find cancer somewhere. you got to have some kind of cancer someplace. Could never find it. The doctor who diagnosed her at the beginning, he died of lung cancer. She tried to tell him to get the treatment. It took him a year to die. She lived nine months, told me, I just want to live long enough to meet my soulmate. She met him. They both died <laughs> right after. Was it psychological? Michael Tierra, some of your audience, and you may know who he is. He's a famous herbalist, Esalen, all that stuff. He went to check out these two ladies. Couldn't find anybody, any results at all. He said, there's nothing to it. Asked my friend Judy Utley. She lived nine extra years because of that hole burned in her back and doing colonics and lots of carrot juice and a whole bunch of other things, never stopped chain smoking and uh, never stopped eating junk food. Just did some health food stuff along with it. Nine years. Wow. That is wild. Um, <laughs> <My style. laughs> this I got some wild questions to end on here. Uh, does Adam think he will continue to live indefinitely or does he still believe that he's aging? You know, uh, aging <laughs> is a a real thing in our culture. And because I'm acculturated, for everybody I say I'm not aging, someone's going to say, hey, you lost your hair, your teeth are going, what the heck are you talking about? So when we see things like that, uh, our vision is our worst enemy because we can get past that. You, you, it takes, It actually takes cultivation of energy to get past it where you can do that. And I know people who have given up sleep. I know people who have done supernatural things. I know people who have reversed aging. And so I have hopes. And now my study is getting more intense with that. We have so many things in our culture that want to divert you, though, you know. Oh, there's some bug out there. There's this going on. Uh, you have to, your car broke down, all those kind of things. You have to be really one focused about it. So it's just no maybe. Uh, Master Chen, who is on, who possibly might end up as one of the Chinese immortals, told me, it's never over till your last breath. So don't give up till your last breath. So I don't know. I frankly say yes, no, baby. I'm, I'm we're going to see and, uh, and see how long I live. I feel lucky to live to 80 because finding solar nutrition saved my life in the 40s. And Ray Pete saved it in the uh, in the 2015 or whenever I started eating the Ray, adding Ray Pete's cherry picking Ray Pete's information onto a solar nutrition diet and using other techniques as well. So hmm. time will tell. Is all I have to say, <laughs> if it exists at all. <laughs> yeah, biological versus chronological aging, right? <laughs> You know, back in the day, there was a theory of eternal recurrence that Nietzsche, uh, Spensky, and other people have bought into, that you live your life over and over. And a psychic at the time named uh, Jane Roberts wrote a book about Seth. And Seth speaks. They went into that we live all our lives simultaneously, forward and backwards, and we just, it's where we focus our attention. There may be something to that. Uh, my friend Adonis Lay, I'm really not sure if he died or not. Because uh, he, he, as well as other of my teachers, said, if you live in the moment, there's no time. 
You can't die as long as you live now. That it's an eternal now. And so many people have said that. It makes me think there's some validity in it. So mm -hmm. Master Chen told me he doesn't know if he's going to be an immortal this lifetime or not. But he's one of those supernatural people that anyone who hangs around with him knows he's not an ordinary mortal. <laughs> neither was a Donald Way, neither was a rabbi I studied with, uh, Michael Shapiro, Michael Shapiro, and neither was my Sufi teacher, Adnan Sarhan. And who's the fourth one I met? Uh, I guess that was it. The, the rabbi, the Sufi, the yogi, and the Qigong guy. <laughs> They're of a, a, they're not all human. That's all I can say. There are people like that. Oh, I hung out with Swami Satchidananda. He also was not all human. Hmm. Maybe Adano like teleported to one of the moons of uh, Jupiter or something. <laughs> Maybe so. He wasn't decomposing at the time, and he <laughs> predicted that his brown eyes would turn blue, which they did. I even had the uh, the coroner was so fascinated with the case. He came to the funeral and said he'd never heard of such a case like that. And also, he wasn't decomposing in the ordinary way, and he smelled like roses. Now, the coroner got that after everybody sent roses, unfortunately. I smelled the body before that, right out of the forehead, smelled of roses. And, wow. But the coroner looked at his abdomen and said, when you don't pump formaldehyde in a body after a week, the abdomen starts to break down. And he was mystified by the fact that it wasn't breaking down. Wow. And we actually had someone try to bring the body back to life. He had the technique where you stick the finger up the butt. Try to do that to a corpse when you're at a funeral. <laughs> Some interesting stories there. I won't go into details. <laughs> wow. I, you know, I heard that about the, the health force guy. What is it? Jameis Sheridan. That so They tried to bring him back to life after he died, which was pretty recent. Um, well, you know, synchronicity is interesting, and I will tell you this story. I was so shocked that my teacher had gone. When we flew into town, we had a copy of uh, Yogananda's book. I opened it up randomly, and it opened up to the place where it said that uh, Yuktaswar had, had uh, rose, in, rose from the dead. And then we got somewhere else, and I opened up another book. It said the same thing. Uh, what was that? This is Shirdi Sai Baba, I think. He said, "I'm gonna, I'm going to stop breathing if I don't come back in three days, bury the body." So he came back. So when I came in, they had, they were talking about they're printing up the Adama Way funeral pamphlet. I said, "I didn't come here from a for a funeral. I came for a resurrection." I went to a Bible lying on the kitchen table, opened it up randomly, pointed to the resurrection of Lazarus. <laughs> My friend Tom's eyes got about that big. And he, <laughs> he ran to the phone and called and said, can you change the thing? Yeah, I'm just about to put it on the burner now. That's why the service was called the Adonis Lay Resurrection Service. But he never resurrected. <laughs> there were a lot of wow. strange things that happened. But, you know, it's it's a it's a the world is, uh, as Carlos Castaneda said, is full of, what is it? awe and terror or something like that that uh, <laughs> that we face in our lives and uh, who knows what that was about <laughs> um that's that's fascinating uh i have another philosophical question for you and uh i want to preface this with an interesting story i heard at a party last week the uh, this one guy, I guess, was knew he was going to be beheaded by guillotine, and he was a scientist. And uh, apparently, you might know the story, but he he told somebody to watch them watch him after his head was lopped off with the guillotine mm -hmm. for his eyes blinking, and he was going to do it in a specific rhythm, like wow. a certain amount of times. And after he was beheaded, he did he blinked exactly as he described to the person. I wish I remembered his name, wow. but. Uh, yeah, someone asked, what's his theory on what happens after death? So I want to share that story first. <laughs> you know, but, I, I studied with another master indirectly, though I did was there in person. 
and he was supposed to be one of the greatest masters on the planet. And he said, even the masters don't know what happens when you die. So I think a lot of these things that happen to uh, after death experiences are uh, the bardos, all those kind of things. I think it's a lot about your culture and what you believe. That's why the best movie that explains that concept is called Flatliners, the original one, the one with Kiefer Sutherland, Julie Roberts, uh, Oliver Platt, uh, Kevin Bacon, I believe. Whoa. That movie explains what I think really happens uh, at death, that a lot of it, the experience we have is uh, out of our own brain. Now, my friend Judy Utley, again, I'll bring her up because she's pertinent to this story, too. She had a friend named Bobby. Bobby died for 18 minutes. He didn't breathe. And he went to the gates. And St. Peter or whoever's there said, you're here early. You're not supposed to be here. He said, he said, but you have a choice. You can either go back now or stay. Well, after 18 minutes, a nurse came into the part in the hospital where they store the corpses and just on a whim started beating on the body's chest, brought Bobby back. So Bobby had that story. Now, Judy Utley, who became, they became a boyfriend and girlfriend for a while. Uh, she died when she was a child and said all she saw was blank, black, nothing. And when, when asked, when O'Donnell was asked about it, he said, that's the greater experience. Everything else is our, is light explaining our situation. Now he said the reality is blank and the brain can't stand blank. But the joy of life is in the geometry and the light. So basically, you might experience what you uh, believe <laughs> when you get there. And in other words, I'm just as confused as the rest of you are about this matter. <laughs> mm. That's really cool. I, yeah, I like the movie What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. I thought that was well done. That was good. I think it was a little too new agey, because, but it was, <laughs> it was one interpretation. I got a friend of mine who I went to see that movie with angry by criticizing certain things about it. In other words, we fixated the one belief path. But it was interesting, and I, I do enjoy those kind of ghosts with uh, Patrick Swayze and those type of movies are fascinating. Can a spirit actually come and learn to kick something like he did and manipulate matter? And I think the jury's out. Uh, I had a girlfriend back in the 60s. Uh, she, when she was a child, her grandfather came to her bed in the middle of the night and just stood and smiled at her. So she ran into her parents' room and, and said, and started crying, granddad's in the room, granddad. No, no, she ran at He's in the room. He's back in so-and-so. They get a call 20 minutes later that he just died. And so... As a child, even, I studied so many of those stories that I figured some of them must be true. Even uh, the person who did the E. Jing, what is his name now? Uh, uh, he had experiences. I think he came to Jung's bed and showed up. And also, a lot of people think that Jung was kind of a normal psychologist. How many psychologists can you say that one time there's a knock on the door and an army of the dead is asking directions? And he gives a direct, it's in memories, dreams, and reflection. So again, the jury's out. We, it's a it's a mystery of life. And perhaps that's the joy of it, living it to see what's going to happen. I love that. Yeah, I don't know. It gives me a lot of peace just yeah. saying that. <laughs> By the way, the, another story I should tell. When Adonal Lay died, he said he died. He fell off a roof for three uh, for three stories, pushed himself out so he didn't land on the cement. But the feeling went out of his body all the way up to his nose where he started breathing. He died in the operating room three times. He said he was shown a man he was supposed to become. And he explained that this man was coming from a Middle Eastern country to study accounting for his dad, blah, 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 all the detail. But he said, but if you take that lifetime, you you may not get a chance at realization for centuries. So do you want to stick around now or not? 
He said, I want to stick around. And they, he said, what do I do? He said, we, Paramahansa Yoganade, he claimed, said, we can't breathe for you. You got to do that yourself. So he decided to breathe. He was in a hospital for a year and nine months recuperating. And years later, we met the cousin of the man he was supposed to come, to come. Exact lifetime. I was there when that happened. And uh, even Adano did the, the double take when he started describing his cousin, who uh, I think his name was Bahani, I forget the cousin's name, who came over from that Middle Eastern country to study econo economics for his dad, blah, blah, and everything else going on. You know, is this just a fantasy? Or is it synchronicity? What the heck is it? <laughs> that's pretty cool <laughs> uh, you mentioned energy cultivation earlier and you predicted this next question someone asked uh, what's the best energy cultivation practice uh, we're finding out what you are rather than who you are so whether you do it from Gurdjieff work chanting Nam Yaho Renge Kyo Omani Padme Hong do your TM mantra or, or do Qigong cultivation uh, waves, I think it's important. One thing you will realize if you pursue this though, there are two chakra systems. One starts at the tailbone and goes up to the third eye. And the second one starts here and goes back to the medulla oblongata, which is the only instant part of the body. The eye of God, assassins know, if you stab a person there, they can't go out. If you shoot them there, they can't yell out. Any place else in the brain, they can yell out. They can even turn around and hit you before they die. But that one spot is instant. So as Adonis Lay explained, we have a spermal system that goes up the spine, and then it cooks into a uh, an ovum system, which is in the brain. So the journey of the audible life stream begins in the center of the forehead on what's called the 10,000 petal lotus and goes back to the medulla oblongata. That's only the beginning of the journey. And I studied many of those books and there seems to be that validity to that. That Kundalini is actually a problem. That's why there are so many so-called Kundalini casualties. So if you look for Kundalini for longevity, it ain't going to work. It'll give you psychic powers. It'll give you insights. It'll give you all kinds of energy, but it's not the way to longevity. Master Chen differentiated between Qigong, which was for healing and used the 12 acupuncture meridians and longevity and immortality and spirituality, which was from the cultivation of the eight extraordinary meridians. And when I met Chen and was sitting in a class one time, and he showed this pattern of a figure eight on, on the, the abdomen. And I realized he was showing me something that Adonis Lay showed me but wouldn't explain. He said, that's something the martial arts artists use. Uh, and he wouldn't tell me anymore. And I was frustrated. So I studied the enteric nervous system, all kinds of things, finding an answer. When I saw that and realized that Chen was drawing that information out, I, he looks at me and said, Adam's been waiting for this information for 30 years. And I said, yeah, 1987 to 2007. I, yeah, 1987 to 2007, I've been waiting. So I wondered, how did he know that? And then he said something strange. He said, funny, I haven't thought about this for 30 years. And then, I let that go. But then I was in the shower two days later and I thought, Chen was studying at Wudang from 6 to 16. He was 10 years old now. And his master sent him across three provinces of China to survive with summer clothes in the winter. And he almost froze to death except for one egg, which that's how Adonis started solar nutrition with the timing of an egg, by the way. So I thought that was really interesting. He wasn't teaching anything. He was trying to survive. So what did he mean? Are all of, are all, are all one? Was he a Donna? Was he, I, I still don't know the answer to that uh, question. And Chen is very tight-lipped about it. 
the answer on it too. But anyway, that's the kind of weird thing seems to follow me around in my life. And probably a lot of your listeners and you yourself are probably having me. One important thing, how are your goats doing? Vibrant Gal told me to make sure I ask that. <laughs> Listen, i with that. Oh, they're doing great. Yeah, still have two does and a buck. And uh, they're actually out there right now building a goat shed for me, one in each. Because we had some some rain come here through North Idaho, and I'm sure there's going to be more as it gets uh, closer to winter. So just to have a, a dry spot where they can hang out with some <laughs> straw. But uh, yeah, they're like big dogs. They they love their pets. And uh, yeah, the buck is such a character. He's just, he'll just ram his gate all day long and he's just entertained. You know, <laughs> That's, I think I'm going to give him a tether ball though. I need to hang that up in there for him. All right. Knock around. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun, and yeah, I'm still into beekeeping. So hopefully, I get some honey. I've two uh two hives to harvest from, and I'm hoping to at least get some honey before the winter would be nice. Because they're seeing right now through my window, there's one highway going out and one going in. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. When Um, the snow gets up there, it probably gets up ten feet deep in places up there. I know. Yeah, especially I'm like kind of the top of a mountain, so I'm I'm really excited. I prefer the cold to the the heat, not in like a Wim Hof way, but it just <laughs> it seems to give me a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, Idaho's a beautiful state. You're living in a nice place. Yeah, it seems like one of the last free spots in the U.S. I keep hearing stories. I know Canada's lost their mind, and that's like <laughs> total draconian. Uh, but yeah, Idaho and Montana. I mean, not to bring people up here. But <laughs> everyone's right. going to move we, in. <laughs> it is a beautiful area. You know, parts of Nevada are beautiful too. My mm. brother said, when you drive away from the highways, they don't want you to know what those parks mm. are back there with the cottonwood and everything. Golly, I've, I've been in some amazingly mis- hidden places in, uh, in, uh, in Nevada that are just mm. startling beautiful. So, Idaho. It's one of my favorite states, going through there either by the bus or visiting my friend Greg three or four or five times. It's just a beautiful place. Yeah, I remember driving up here to Idaho from Southern California and going through Nevada, and it was just prisons. Like, it was just desert from sunup till sundown. And I was seeing signs, you know, uh, what would happen to, you know. It seems like if someone got out of jail, they wouldn't. They would just die and, and dehydrate or something. <laughs> There's just nothing for miles and miles, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I know I've been about eight feet away from a charging moose <laughs> right inside of the building. Comes running by with its uh, baby galloping behind it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a big bull that comes by almost every day here uh, <laughs> of a salt block out, and it licks it. And I You're really want to see a grizzly. There's, I'm in grizzly country, like right yeah. next to my house. Like they're right here, and um, I don't want to be face to face, but I nope. want to see one. Yeah. I've never seen. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's black bears and brown bears up there too, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, we've, I've seen some bears up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I watched a lot of bear attack videos a couple of months ago. I was just obsessed with uh, animal attacks, and it seems like the mountain lions are because people think of bear attacks is the worst, but mountain lions they'll go for your neck and they'll always attack from behind and they'll yeah. stalk you. So it's, it's like worse than a bear. <laughs> yeah. We've, I've seen it in Arizona. There were warnings on the trail. They'll, they'll attack adults too, usually children, but adults, mm-hmm. you have to, they have strategies where you make yourself look bigger and do all kinds of things and never make direct eye contact with them though. When you do that, they have all kinds of instructions. They are dangerous. There, we have them around here even sometimes. I've, I've seen one, one time when we were hiking. Wow. Yeah, my neighbor said for each one you see, there's like 30 that have seen you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a buddy in the seventh grade that killed one with an axe. He was really strong for his age. And he was up in the, he had a big bear someplace like that. His parents had a cap and he wanted to attack him. And he happened to have an axe that he was doing chopping. And he chopped it right through the skull. Killed it. Yeah, Bob Benson was his name. Interesting guy. Wow. Yeah, I did. I do bear spray and a gun, and that's my. That's my <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good. Good. 
<laughs> but Adam, it's always you don't know that cayenne pepper or the uh, what is it capsicum mm-hmm. that will protect you from killer bees. It's about the only thing. So if you ever get attacked by killer bees and it's legal or illegal if you want to carry it while you're hiking, just spray that in the air and they'll all go away. Otherwise, I've had friends that have almost died from being attacked by killer bees just out innocently hiking and they decided to attack them. He fortunately made it back in the cover after getting multiple stings. Yeah. Wow. That's good to know. Yeah. It, I I haven't been stung many times by any creature, but I remember I got stung walking into the health food store in the neck by a, by a honeybee. <laughs> And I felt amazing for that entire day. Like it definitely <laughs> supercharged my brain. <laughs> it gets your adrenaline going. I got to say in the middle of the finger one time and scream. I was at a sales meeting. We were selling magazines door to door. And suddenly I scream out the top of my lungs. I didn't know what was getting my finger. And everybody looks at me and said, oh, the bee. <laughs> yeah, their their whole social structure is so fascinating. I've seen a few documentaries on they're like they dance to communicate, you know, about where where the flowers are, and they're they're like an alien species. <laughs> they really are. They uh, they know they follow uh, chronobiological rhythms to an exact. They use magnetism, probably uh, both may uh, let's see iron and other minerals in the brain that they use to orient. They thought that was a fiction, but Frank Brown, that same guy we started the show with the professor of uh, chronobiology he was right after all it took him about 20 more years to prove that they really do in our pineal gland and other places in the brain we have little metal particles that actually direct people to and fro i've even met human beings that had that ability that uh, just used it usually it's among so-called primitive people they know how to get mm-hmm. places the the aborigines are famous there's a movie about three kids who were separated from their parents 2,000 miles away and they walked home. No compass. They walked home. And they had police after them, rangers and everything, and they caught one of them, but the two of them got all the way home. So finally the Australian government said, I'll let them stay. (laughs) (laughs) They were still alive at the time I saw that movie. (laughs) Wow. Um, Last question here. How to mitigate the effects of fluoride? Because you mentioned the the uh, crystals in the brain, because you're one of the mind blowers that people would hear from you is that you want to calcify your pineal gland, right? <laughs> yeah, and people people find that hard to believe. See, <laughs> we have something called Iceland spar that's in the pineal gland. It's a type of calcium uh, carbonate, a good carbonate, and that actually forms a clear lens. It was used by George uh, Eastman in the developing of the Polaroid camera. Later, he switched to quinine which has qualities of the Iceland spar and of the calcium carbonate. Now, we have other things that get in the brain, including in the pineal gland, including aluminum and things like that. But the pineal gland and the inner ear is the only place where they have otoliths, which are calcium crystals. If you get them, not of calcium phosphate, but of calcium uh, carbonate, then they are actually beneficial and can give you so-called second sight and things like that. So anyone who knows fluorine, if you take fluoride, your teeth uh, get hard, but they fall out. They eventually get marvinized. You can look that word up. It means they start to get clear where you can see through the teeth, and then they fall apart. So obviously, it's not going to form calcium crystals, anything but. It starts deteriorating it if you get enough. And indeed, the pineal is an indicator of how much fluorine you're getting in your diet. And as a chemical engineering and news magazine journal for chemists says, the proportion of fluorine in your bone is directly proportional to the amount of bone cancer. So people... It may be good for your teeth for a while, but it's not good for the rest of your body, including the pineal gland, which it will break down, not build up crystals. It will start to marmonize your entire body, including your bones, making them softer. So first it makes it harder, and the more you take, the softer it gets. So a lot of people think, well, you're for fluorine then? 
<laughs> anything <laughs> but. It's bad stuff, and uh, calcium will help you get rid of it. And uh, uh, so the chlorine will, too, in salt. Salt mm -hmm. is the best defense against fluoride, whether it's sodium fluoride or whatever it is. Simple sodium chloride, plain salt, will actually start to clean the fluoride out of your body and actually help the building of your pineal gland, second sight unit, third eye, whatever you want to call it. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm about to open that up again. I, I haven't done my sensory deprivation floating for the last four or five <laughs> months and feel like a different person. But uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to start that up again because I, you know, moving and it was a process. But yeah, it was amazing how how much light I saw in that pitch black pod. It's just it 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 seems so bright at times. I'm like, where is this light coming from? Yeah, <laughs> you know the. Uh... The leather tiger I told you about, George Wellington Adams, and the Don Lay, they bought two diving bells, and they were going to make a floating flotation chamber in a pressurized hyperbaric chamber and call it an enlightenment machine. It never did come to fruition because they, uh, my friend George couldn't pay the rent on, on the storage unit. <laughs> they took the things away, even though Don Lay invested a thousand dollars in it to start up. But uh, we, someone may one day will experiment with that. Maybe it'll be you. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. There, there's a device called the Harmonic Egg, which I think is like forty or fifty thousand dollars. And it's um, there's people trying to create like med beds or like healing machines, but they're super expensive. And this one uses like light and sound and geometry, mm -hmm. and it, the egg shape's supposed to bounce around things. Yeah, but. Um, I want to use one someday. I like trying different things like the, uh, what's it called? The magnetron or something they had in Nevada, like that huge magnetic room. I think mm -hmm. some of these things have validity. <laughs> I've been to the so-called time machine in uh, near Palm Springs. Have you heard about that thing? Maybe. It's, it's an, what was it? the integratron. The integratron. Yeah, I have for, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before the New Agers ruined it, it used to be supposedly built from the architecture of Space Brothers, according to the engineer, who was sent there to build that airport by Howard Hughes, by the way. Well, he said aliens told him how to build the Integratron. Well, when we went there, this was an amazing thing. I went with Donald Lay and five or six other friends. And we went upstairs, and they put you, they had circles drawn on the floor. Now, if you were in one circle and talked to someone in the same circle, you sounded like you were in a microphone. If you were in one of the other circles, it was just ordinary voice. But then Adamo pulled a trick on us. He said, go down and get the Prisoner of Love, which was a tape. You can listen to it. It's on the internet now, the Prisoner of Love. He said, bring it up here. It wouldn't magnify like that. It didn't do anything. Now, he said it was the Prisoner of Love. But knowing that Adamo sometimes would trick you, I had a friend of mine, she was going to the Integraton, please get a tape with any music and play it and see if that happens there or not. Because it's been bugging me for all this time. Is it something in the human voice that will magnify like that? Or is it actually, did the prisoner of love really work? Well, she never got the tape, even though she went to the Integraton. But you can find that they still have a lot of videos on it, but they've kind of jazzed it up. Back then, it wasn't open to tourists except for a $5 tour uh, if you knew someone who knew someone to get there. Now it's they've made quite a big thing about it, and they have uh, changed the geometry. So uh, mm. I haven't been there for a long time. Very interesting, though. though just the guy there told me that uh, he had gone in there and changed his, his gray hair to black by hanging out there. Now, he had eaten a lot of bologna sandwich, and Adamo leaned over to me and said, it's all the dye in the bologna that turned his hair black. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? Wow. Uh, have you ever been to that spot in Northern California where supposedly it's like a cabin where it makes you taller? <laughs> when, when I was a, uh, when we first came to California, we went up the coast, I think in 56, way back then, that thing was in operation. <laughs> and also the gravity. You've seen the gravity yeah. one too? You're, you think you're, you're straight and actually you're leaning over to the side. Yeah, there's some really effect. 
if someone who listens to your show will check, I swear to God, as a kid, I had a memory of this. I went and saw a plaque at that site right here by the beach. And it said, this is where the Chinese landed in 1132. <laughs> Which blew my mind as a kid. And since then, there's all these books being written about that the first people to get to the United States and even uh, other places in the world were the Chinese fleet, which was supposedly destroyed and they never got here. But who knows? <laughs> wow. Interesting. Um, awesome, Adam. Well, I think this was a lot of info. and uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> people will love it. And it's always fun. Yeah, I love having you on and appreciate you uh, sharing your wisdom. Um, you're one of my favorite return guests. And it's there's always something new to, to chat about. So, Same here. I really enjoy talking with you, Matt. Right on. Well, uh, thanks, Adam. Yeah, I'll put all the links below where people can buy your eBooks and uh, stick around as we close out the show. Thanks so much. <laughs> we'll see. I'll give you a progress report. <laughs> and things are actually getting better. One of the things I've, I've gotten rid of the varicose veins in my left leg. Uh, they were bulging, wow. and now they're smoothing out. You can see traces of them, but it's getting back to normal. My right one, because of female trauma, I had a bicycle accident uh, with one of my wives. The day she left me, I had that accident. I went over the top of my bicycle, got up, and the scientist in me is looking at the left side, looking for any kind of injury. Meanwhile, I had road rashes from my ear down to my feet. The whole one side of my body took me a whole year to rehabilitate from that, leaving more problems with my leg which was already a Frisbee magnet, a uh, horseshoe magnet. Everything would hit that right leg because I had to deal with my female issues. Anyway, wow. that one still has the varicose veins bulging, but the other one's gone down to normal. So there's another thing wow. that I attribute the orange juice, the mm -hmm. lack of uh, PUFAs, particularly PUFAs or omega-3s, and we'll see. So maybe I will make it to <laughs> plus 100 or more. I think you will for sure. Yeah, it's that's one of the most fun things about me with like living a long time or just being on this path is old injuries that you've had for years or not injuries, but just physical features or whatever. Like I have a little hole in my left hand and a little scrape on my left hand just from playing around as a kid and, you know, jumping down a telephone pole kind of thing. <laughs> and I wonder if those will just heal up over time with a you know, combination of everything that I'm doing. Yeah, they can. Uh, you can actually get rid of scars, a lot of people don't know, by tapping lightly in a, counter, in a clockwise direction or even take a feather. It puts energy into that area. And I, I've learned about this, and I have friends that have actually tried it and got rid of scars. I myself had, in high school, I slid into third base in my shorts and had a big scar on my leg, and it took about 20 years to go away. But it was a scar about two inches long. It went completely away. Now, I've been working on reflexes in that because that same scar is, you'll see a little spot here by the ear was a reflex to the knee. You'll find it in my eye, and you'll find it in other places on my body that match it. So many times, is that a predestination? I've had injuries that I felt the sore spot that I got injured the day before it happened. Now, how did it get sore before I had the injury? Is this time and space? Wow. There's a lot of mysteries out there. And as wow. humans, you'd be open to all this kind of things without getting being gullible about it. But mm -hmm. there's more than medical science wants us to believe. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the scarring thing's interesting because I've I'm into my serapeptase and natokinase and systemic enzyme stuff. Um, but I'm sure there's so many ways that our body could naturally break down that fibrin over time. Uh, I guess we just lose the ability with all the assaults. <laughs> yeah. Enzymes help. You know, a lot of uh, pet lovers use uh, uh, papaya enzymes to get mm -hmm. rid of the cat ears and cat's intestines and, and the birds mm -hmm. often get that kind of stuff in their intestines. He used to buy, when I was doing a health food business, he used to buy that all the time and tell me it works. So uh, yeah. I'm not against supplements. I'm against over-supplementation mm -hmm. 
where you forget about the implements to get the supplements. That's what I'm mainly against. If you, that, health is a lifestyle. But then if supplements mm -hmm. work, I'm experimenting right now with dolomite again uh, mm -hmm. to get a little extra calcium and magnesium. Uh, supposedly high in iron, but and I'm nervous about iron because the last two times I took a little bit of a mixture of tomato juice and uh, molasses, I started to come down with a cold. And mm. this is something we've heard about from other sources. So I don't know if it's in my head or not, but that bottle of uh, molasses is sitting dormant right now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think of pearl powder? Because I was using that just uh, on my teeth. It felt right to just swish with it, like just take a scoop in my mouth and just rub my tongue, the pearl powder all around my mouth. You know, any kind of calcium in the, in the mouth has been proven mm -hmm. to reduce cavities. So, yeah. Mm. So whether you hold it in your mouth and the product or that one, uh, mm -hmm. is that out of oyster shell? I've forgotten, but yeah, it, it can mm -hmm. work. So yeah, uh, the research shows clearly that that works. Now you can even rebuild enamel some way by taking either Monterey, Monterey Jack, Swiss cheese or aged cheddar and combine it with, uh, a little bit of a clove of garlic and a slice of red onion. At 6.15 in the sundial time, and it can actually rebuild some of the enamel. Uh, hmm. It's been done, and guess who endorses it? NASA. Says the only, those three cheeses are the only ones that are karyo, uh, they have a word, fighting cat cavities. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the, uh, what do you call it in chewing gum they put now? Uh, mm. What is it? Xylitol. But xylitol yeah. is a genetic product from birch trees, and you'd be surprised what kind of uh, genetic bacteria they use to make it. Uh, but I'm not against it if it works. Xylitol is the fourth one that NASA endorses for that. Other ones are what they call karyostatic. They don't cause it. They don't cure it. But those four substances NASA says will actually rebuild the lumen. It will rebuild an animal. So... I don't know about the garlic and the uh, onion. I learned that from Madonna Lay, who said there were ingredients that combined with that cheese to your advantage. And kidney time from seven, from six, uh, from five to seven p.m. is actually involved in the calcification of your skeleton and teeth. That's been well known. It's no accident that K1, kidney one, is the only meridian that starts in the bottom of your feet, not in the Akabani points on the toes, so that you can stomp on that. And by stomping on that, you can build bone. NASA, wow. has, re NASA has, has uh, researched that and found that's true. Stomping more than weight-bearing exercises does more to build bone than just standing still with weights. They put people with 50-pound weights and astronauts walk them all around. No added calcium. They jumped up and down with a pounding noise, and they go bone. Wow. Maybe it's like the micro fractures that are created in the, in the yep. bones. Or <laughs> and also frequency. If you get the frequency of a cat's fur, you can build bone by standing on one of those mm. machines or just hold a cat's fur where you get the base tones of the fur through your entire body. So people can build, build bones by having a cat in their life. Wow. Yeah, I just got a kitten recently. So now I have two uh, purring machines. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They're, they're build. You know, it was featured in, uh, in uh, National Geographic magazine, but they wouldn't give the frequency. I had to go to mm -hmm. a uh, veterinary book to find out the frequency. And it was the cat's purr. And you have to be careful. If you select individual frequency there's one about 31 seconds per second breaks bone they used to break marriage in the piano that way so but the cat obviously isn't going to take one and break its own bone so a purr in the wild is often used as a healing device as a cat in the wild or even a lion will purr they'll purr and they know it heals their bone same wow. with human beings i love that because i feel like dogs get more credit than uh than cats and um, you know, cats have a huge benefit. You know, you could 
you could travel easier, you heal your bones. <laughs> <laughs> but cats don't have ongers, they have stamps. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> awesome, Adam. Well, um, yeah, thanks so much. This it, this is so fun. We'll have to do it more often. Maybe maybe once a month is a good uh Enjoy the heck out of this. Yeah, yeah, it's great. We'll uh stick around as we close out the show. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> There's not many people I can imagine speaking to for hours and hours and hours nonstop. I could count them on one hand, and Adam Bergstrom is on that list. If you've never heard of him or his work, check out solartiming.com and his ebooks. He has a ton of mini ebooks and newsletters, a whole series on sex which is contrary to a lot of the information you hear in the natural health community. He has a ton of books on yellow fat disease, and I recommend those often to people that are skeptical about omega-3s being harmful to your health. And he actually just released a new one called Yellow Fat Disease Redux. And some of the chapters include cod liver oil abuse, something fishy in Greenland, vitamin A and cod liver oil, age spots in the heart, why I'm not a mitochondriac, word magic, 1% linoleic acid soybeans. Really fascinating stuff. He always helps me to connect more dots. And I find fascinating the wordplay with alpha-linolenic acid and alpha-linoleic acid. And I like his little tip to make it easier to remember. Remember that ends for no. So alpha-linolenic acid is worse than alpha-linoleic acid because linoleic omega-6 does not contribute to yellow fat disease or lipofuscin. Another thing I like about Adam Bergstrom is that we don't agree on certain things. And that's so awesome because that's a sign of intelligence when you could disagree on something and still respect each other and not resort to personal attacks or whatever. So we disagree that magnesium needs to be supplemented. I'm on the yes side of that fence, and he's on the no side that we can get it all from steamed vegetables, which Ray Pete talks about. And so I think it all comes down to personal experience and context and you always hear in the health community find what works for you and there's a certain aspect to that but there's also blanket things that generally work for everybody and limiting polyunsaturated fatty acid intake unless in the rare one percent or less of people that have hyperthyroidism if it is actual hyperthyroidism a lot of the time that is just masked hypothyroidism but that's a whole nother topic but if it's a true very rare case of it's like wilson's disease right copper toxicity is so rare it's like one in forty thousand people similar thing with hyperthyroidism in that case in that context then omega-3s are good because they will slow the thyroid they will inhibit the thyroid they'll slow the metabolism down and in the context of hyperthyroidism, that's a good thing. So Adam Bergstrom often says, anything could be a medicine and anything could be a poison. And I really like that approach because it's balanced and it means that there's a time and a place for everything. That said, I think the reason for a lot of dysfunction and chronic health conditions not getting better or just temporarily getting better, which people mistake for healing, is because people are taking supplements like zinc, ascorbic acid, omega-3s like algae oil, fish oil, krill oil, vitamin D, iron, multi-mineral supplements, multivitamins, synthetic vitamin A. I would say that most of the supplements that people are consuming are actually 
not only preventing them from healing, but causing new issues like the calcification, lipofuscin, and fibrosis, part of my CLF protocol that I always talk about. A lot of this is not just because of the normal things you hear about, the pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, glyphosate, geoengineering spraying, the aluminum, the EMFs, the GMOs, all the basic stuff. That is quite basic. When you get down to it, it's the accumulations in the body over time that causes a lot of issues. And in the future, I'd like to pick Adam Bergstrom's brain on the topic of minerals because I think that him and I agree on a lot of things regarding minerals that they can actually cause a lot of harm. I think there's a misunderstanding in the natural health community, the mainstream health community, that the more minerals, the better. But no one ever stops and asks what form and ratios are necessary for health. Most people are megadosing the wrong forms. For example, that Calm product that you find at CVS Pharmacy, magnesium citrate, which causes a lot of issues, largely a huge laxative effect. And magnesium oxide, magnesium carbonate, pretty much Costco quality supplements. Those are not supplements. Those are harmful substances that will create further mineral imbalance and metabolic dysfunction. So a big part of my message with my vehicle of MitoLife is... Hey, throw most of your supplements in the trash can and start to take the right supplements. So if you're taking a vitamin K2, D3 combination, you're actually not getting any K2. That's like taking vitamin E and fish oil in the same handful. The vitamin E is just going to get canceled out by the fish oil. Same thing with the vitamin D. The vitamin D3 cholecalciferol is going to cancel out the vitamin K2. And this is why people aren't seeing improvement in their health. And I have a ton of wild testimonials on my Instagram page. I have a highlight called testimonials. And there's quite a few of people getting really fast results just with this one little piece alone, just cutting out the harmful supplements that are creating a lot of dysfunction and imbalance. and adding in the right ones. I think that a lot of people are confused because of the marketing campaigns by companies that sell liposomal pump products, which are trending right now. And they say that faster absorption is better and that liquid form is better. And there's all this marketing and it's all actually false. A lot of the time we want slower absorption and we don't want micelle liposomal grade supplements because what if that's ascorbic acid that's going to deplete you of copper that's going to be even more harmful than just taking a pill of powdered vitamin c to take the liquid micelle slash liposomal ascorbic acid that's going to deplete you of copper at the really deep level of the mitochondria and cause extreme iron dysregulation which then contributes to insulin resistance, neurodegenerative diseases, skin diseases, and lipofuscin. Ascorbic acid supplementation, which is not vitamin C, it's a part of vitamin C, that contributes to the formation of lipofuscin by increasing the excess iron that's stored in your tissues. As I often say, I speak from experience. All the things I speak out against now, I used to do myself. I used to be on the quantum health megadosing omega-3s. I was on a pescatarian diet. I was slamming tons of salmon and doing the naked sunbathing in the cold bath with excessive UV light. And that blue light and UV light, even from the sun, will react with the lipofuscin and the PUFAs in your tissue and cause extreme oxidative stress, and it will spread, especially in the retina. That's one of the areas of the body that lipofuscin targets is the eyes. 
And like the teeth and the gums and dental health, I believe the eyes are an often neglected area of health. People forget that there's this connection between the eyes and the brain and whatever harms your eyes is going to harm the brain. And my big two protective substances for the eyes that I use are vitamin E and niacinamide, also called nicotinamide, which is a form of vitamin B3. Both of those are incredibly protective and healing substances for the eyes. So that's my little rant. I'm going to put the link below to Adam Bergstrom's website, solartiming.com. Definitely go and support him by purchasing his eBooks. They're really affordable and they will help you as a shortcut so that you don't have to spend hours and hours and hours researching, especially on the omega-3 topic. Adam Bergstrom compiled all the data that's really hard to find on the internet as he talks about. My website is Matt hyphen blackburn.com you could read about my clf protocol in the blog section there i have recipes up people always ask me how i make my pancakes and it's slightly different from what i put there with the flour i've been using local stone ground white flour but it's pretty much the same stuff and if you click shop you can see all of my recommended products I want to highlight the beef liver capsules. A lot of people don't like consuming beef liver because it's gross or they didn't grow up with it or whatever. And so the capsules work just the same. And I really like Saturi because they're freeze dried, not desiccated. And I've tried a lot of different beef liver capsule brands out there and they all have a gamey smell to it. But when I opened their bottle for the first time, I was really pleasantly surprised that the gaminess smell was very faint. So there's a huge difference there just with the smell between desiccated and freeze dried. And I believe these work just as well as the real thing. And most people could benefit from taking this with its high vitamin A content as retinol and its bioavailable copper content. It also has vitamins B2 and B9 and choline and CoQ10 and other awesome things. But the main stars are the retinol and the copper. And the retinol helps activate the copper. And that helps you utilize oxygen better and regulate iron and regulate your iron recycling system. I think it's one of the most important supplements that people could take. And if you cut the wrong supplements out, as I mentioned earlier, and then you add this one in, you'll see even quicker results. And my brand is called MitoLife, and you can find that at mitolife.co. And I've had some inventory issues with the world events going on right now, slowing everything down, but we're slowly working to get products back in stock. Uh, update on the vitamin E that's going to be mid-September at the absolute latest by the 17th. And the dissolve it all systemic enzymes are slated to release at the end of September. And the oyster has been coming in in small batches, kind of like the Shilajit. But we did just get more tablets in for the Panacea product. And so that should be in stock in significant amounts very soon. But in the meantime, the whole food vitamin C, the resiliency product, the Purely K, the NAD power are in stock. And that's a great trio to use. Most people could benefit from those. Then we also have a really powerful multiple digestive enzyme. A lot of people are having digestive issues. So I have digested all, which is really high in multiple different types of proteases, which break down excess protein. And then I have Dairy Absorb, which is helpful if you're just reintroducing dairy, which is a superfood and incredible for health. And then I have the spore-based probiotics, which are good to take with every meal to reduce endotoxin. So thanks so much for listening. I'm really happy with how this show is growing. Thank you for sharing my episodes with your friends and family. There's a new show released every Friday. 
and I will see you guys next week. Stay supercharged.